Okay, so I'm going to call this meeting to order December 20th, 2023. In attendance, we have uh, Randy Iser, Jane Nevin Smith, myself, Amy Parsons, and Molly Keegan. Absent tonight is Joyce Chunglow. I'm going to have to hear Your my voice all There's a lot of feedback. There's no speaker on. Mm -hmm. Alex, are you able to fix that? Or? I'm working on it. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so we're going to start off this meeting um, with the Community Block Development Grant and ADA. So we have John O'Leary and Jim Mazik here. So John's going to start off um, with an update on the rehab, and then Jim's going to go into the ADA. Mike Kennedy as well. And Mike Kennedy as well. Um, if you guys want to come up forward here to the microphone. Did you check to see if this microphone was on? This one. Hey, there's a button on the top of the present. Yeah, it's a presentation, yeah. Good. All right. Hey. Good evening. Yes. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, provide uh, the select board as well as residents of Hadley um, on the performance of the town's FY21 Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, just a quick background, this um, grant um, was applied for funds through the state's Community Development Block Grant Program with the town of South Hadley. Um, so between the two towns, they received a total grant award of $570,500 to fund two activities. One of those activities being the Housing Rehabilitation Assistance Program and then an ADA self-evaluation and transition plan. Uh, just to quickly uh, give an overview of those two activities, the Housing Rehabilitation Assistance Program provides loans to uh, individual homeowners um, up to the amount of $40,000 to um, improve homes through, uh, whether it be code in, uh, improvements, uh, house, uh, roofing, siding, windows, weatherization, heating systems, uh, bringing any plumbing and electrical up to code. Uh, it's a, the program is pretty nice in that um, it's a 15 year deferred payment loan. So if the homeowner remains in that home for more than 15, 15 years, the uh, loan is actually forgiven and it becomes a grant. Um, we still do have funding available for that program. So if there's anyone that's interested in applying, uh, I would suggest that you reach out to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, at 413-781-6045 and ask for Shirley Stevens. Uh, she's our intake specialist or someone in the town can point us in the direction uh, to our commission. So to date, we have seven applicants um, that we have town owner agreements in place. Of those seven projects, four are currently in the bidding phase. Two projects are under construction and one project has achieved substantial completion. So it's moving forward pretty well. But again, like I said, just to stress, there is still funding available. So if anyone's interested, please apply. Um, and then the second activity, uh, is the ADA self-evaluation and transition plan. So the town received funds um, to hire a consultant to conduct a uh, self-evaluation transition plan. Uh, just a quick background on that. Um, the town put together an RFQ uh, for procurement for the consultant that went out in early spring. Um, by May 12th, we the town had received three proposals. Of those three proposals, uh, the Center for Living and Working um, group out of Worcester was uh, selected uh, and awarded the contract, um, which um, then got underway in the summer. Uh, and actually, I have one of those uh, consultants here with me, Jim Mazik, who will talk more about the plan itself uh, and how, how it went. I'm actually going to uh, defer to Mike. So I'm actually a subcontract to Central Living Work. Now. We've been in partnership for probably 15, 16 years or so. Um, but I'll talk in a second. I'll let Mike introduce himself, a little bit of background himself. I'll do the same, and then we'll get right into the, the ADA one. All so right, Mike? great. Uh, yep, uh, thanks, uh, Jim. Can everybody hear me? Can't hear you, Mike. Oh, no. Um, because everything seems to be fine at my oh, end. You want yeah, one 
Go ahead, Mike. Very good. Okay. Okay. How about now? Good. good. Better. All right. Great. Great. Hey, I'll uh, I'll uh, be brief. Uh, uh, I'm, I understand that uh, uh, time is of the essence here. So uh, I I just want to start off by saying um, on behalf of uh, Center for Limited Working, uh, the uh, the ADA Plan uh, Consulting uh, Firm in partnership with uh, Jim Mazik, who is uh, right there uh, with you. Uh, I just wanna say thank you uh, so much for uh, entrusting us to uh, administer your self-evaluation and uh, transition plan. So what I'll do from here, I'll uh, go back, I'll uh, defer back to uh, Jim and uh, let him, uh, uh, you know, start. And then I'll, uh, I'll be back on for uh, the, uh, the actual self-evaluation uh, portion of uh, the plan. But but other than that, the background is I've uh, been, uh, uh, you know, working with cities and towns for uh, uh, many, many years now. And uh, most of that has been in uh, partnership with uh, Jim, uh, you know, and God, we've uh, worked on, uh, on probably a good uh, 30 uh, cities and towns uh, in Massachusetts uh, together. So uh, that being said, I'm gonna uh, defer back to uh, Jim. Hey, thanks Mike. Uh, so those of you who don't know me, I know Carolyn does and we've met Jane. Um, I'm, I'm a planner by trade, um, 40 years in the planning profession uh, in Eastern part of the state and in, in uh, Western Mass. And the past 32 years up to 2020, prior to my retirement, was acquired by the Planning Commission. I always saw Community Development Department, it was also Executive Director. Um, I did these plans independently in the around 2000 to 2005, six, seven, eight. Um, then that's when I partnered with Center for Living Working Inc. And we've done these throughout the Commonwealth. Actually, I'm gonna make a correction on Mike. We've done uh, close to 50 ADA plans across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, we collect, uh, both individually and collectively, uh, since 2018, Mike and I have, uh, completed over 25 ADA plans and that goes from Berkshires all the way to, um, Halifax, which is right next to Bridgewater in uh, Plymouth and actually down to the Cape to have done. So anyway, um, so background. The American with Disabilities Act. It was signed into law by President George H. W. Bush back in 1990. Um, it's a civil rights law. It is intended that there is equal access to programs and services to all, regardless of physical or mental impairment. There are five titles under the ADA. There are two titles that are particular to a municipality, such as yourself. Um, Title one is employment, equal employment opportunity. Title two is um, programs and services. So it's tended that, that, that there is uh, equal access to programs and services in a governmental jurisdiction. And that is the requirement for a self-evaluation and transition plan to evaluate and determine recommendations for your programs and services. Um, the current standards are the 2010 ADA standards that went into effect in 2012. Massachusetts also had its own specialized section of the state building code, 521 CMR. Uh, it is a building code. It is strictly governed by construction and, and triggered by construction. It is not a civil rights law. So if the work on a building is um, less than 30% of the value and $100,000 worth of work is being done, just the work needs to be made accessible. If it's under 30% of the value, over $100,000, then the work, access, bathroom, dripping fountain, a couple of things need to be done within that building. If the work is more than 30% of the value of the building, then the entire building must be brought into compliance. Um, there are differences under 521 and, and the ADA standards. Uh, we look at the higher of the two. If you had a chance to look at the um, report, you'll notice that the tables that we have, that we cite the codes for the ADA and also 521. And we, again, we recommend in the recommendation piece, what needs to be done for compliance is based on the higher standard of the two. Um, the policy content and uh, the, plan, the plan content and format. There are four sections. Again, for those of you, I don't know if you, if you all had a chance to at least browse through it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And Jane, I know you've already found some typos and corrections and that's why this is a final draft. We're gonna give, we're gonna say two weeks that folks who look at it, get us, and we'll make the change for print on your hard copies. Um, so, uh, where was I? Uh, okay, so we have four four sections of the plan. We have what we call the front end, 
um, and it's a more of a reference area. We have the similar it's for all, all the plans we do, but we tailor it as need for each municipality. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, mm -hmm. We have the self evaluation piece, which Mike is going to talk about. Um, we have the transition plan, which is the individual facility uh, assessments, and then the appendices, which includes any policies, procedures, forms, or whatever they, we recommend they're in here. Uh, the front end, I'm not going to go into all detail on that. Um, but there, there are these that we want you to be able to have this as a, like a one-stop shopping guide. So we have things in there, which if you have questions, what you, you can you can refer in that front end piece. Uh, that includes about EV charging station guidance because there aren't regs on that. Um, historic properties, more information about those different state and federal regulations. We have a section on emergency preparedness for persons with disabilities. We have a section on ADA support versus service animals. Um, we have a section on ADA compliant portable toilets and not going into details of that, but that we've never seen an ADA compliant portable toilet. And you'll, if you read that section in the, um, you know, in that front end piece, you'll, you'll know why. A section on emergency Iowa stations. And we also have a section, which is a more recent addition we've done on assessment routes of travel and different play surface materials, including playground surface materials. We have about 12 or, or so different types of materials that can, eat, that can be used. We have pros and cons, and we have a cost estimate per square foot of, of each of those. Uh, on the self-evaluation piece, um, only five areas are required to look at. We look at 11 different areas because some of these are, are important, so you need should have some content within your plan. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go back on the transition plan uh, uh, more detail, but I'm going to turn it over to Mike. He's going to talk about some of the findings on the self eval, um, and then I'll get back on the transition. So, Mike, you want to talk about the self eval? Oh, absolutely, uh, Jim. Thank you uh, very much. So, uh, yep. So, just uh, you know, for uh, the sake of time, I'm just going to really uh, go over uh, things at a high level, <laughs> and just know that uh, you know. Uh, once the plan is uh, complete, that, you know, uh, we're not fly by night, we're uh, available, uh, you know, for uh, questions uh, anytime, including what's on the uh, self-evaluation piece. So I'm just going to uh, go uh, as quick as I can down the line here. So first, uh, commissions on uh, disability. Um, it, appear, it doesn't appear that uh, Hadley has one. So it's recommended that the... Uh, Town through uh, annual uh, town meeting action, um, uh, except the uh, uh, you know provisions of uh, Mass General Law C40 Section uh, 8J to establish a commission on disability and allow the uh, select board to uh, appoint a minimum of five members to uh, serve on this board. The um, next uh, is uh, ADA coordinator. The um, uh, the Human uh, Resources uh, Director, Troy uh, Brin, is listed as the ADA coordinator on the Mass Office on Disabilities uh, website under its uh, min municipal uh, ADA coordinator listing. However, the uh, annual uh, town reports uh, list uh, town administrator uh, Carolyn Brennan as the uh, ADA coordinator. Recommendation, uh, you know, uh, Hadley uh, should clarify the appointment of the ADA coordinator uh, and uh, and let uh, Mass Office on Disability know if it is uh, uh, Car Carolyn as opposed to uh, uh, Troy. And uh, the uh, town should, uh, you know, name the ADA coordinated. Uh, yeah coordinated in its uh, related ADA documents, including uh, the grievance procedure, ADA public notice and reasonable uh, accommodations policy, which I'm gonna talk about uh, further. And um, in absence of a uh, commission on disability, cre consider creating a uh, ADA or an ADA coordinator webpage under departments and add uh, the ADA uh, related documents uh, in that uh, web page. So, public notice. Uh, you know, the uh, town's website doesn't doesn't uh, appear to have any kind of uh, non discrimination uh, policies uh, 
regarding its residents or uh, vis visitors with disabilities. So it's uh, recommended that the town adopt a uh, public notice of non-discrimination, uh, which should be added to the uh, coordinate, ADA coordinator's uh, webpage under departments. And, uh, you know, this notice should be uh, posted on town hall bulletin boards and, uh, and uh, yeah, on the town uh, bulletin boards and uh, in the uh, website. Uh, ADA grievance procedure. It does not appear that the town of Hadley uh, has a uh, has adopted a uh, ADA grievance procedures as required under the ADA. Uh, there's uh, certainly no uh, policy uh, uh, mentioned in the town's website. Um, you know, so uh, so it's recommended that uh, the a uh, grievance procedure should be formally adopted if it hasn't already done so. And this uh, grievance procedure should include the ADA uh, coordinated by name, title, and contact information, and then uh, posted in the uh, town's uh, website and town hall uh, bulletin boards. And uh, we also uh, uh, included a uh, sample uh, grievance procedure for, uh, for your uh, use. Next up is, uh, policies, procedures, and uh, yeah, policies and procedures. Recommendations, it's recommended uh, that the town adopt a reasonable accommodation policy, discuss further, and incorporate uh, non-discrimination language, essential function requirements, physical requirements, and uh, employment uh, listings and uh, job descriptions. And again, uh, there's, you know, there'll uh, be, uh, uh, you know, samples, uh, uh, you know, uh, a sample to, uh, you know, uh, use as a guide. Reasonable accommodations, uh, you know, with, uh, reviewing, uh, you know, reviewing the uh, uh, job descriptions, well, the few that I uh, had to uh, choose from, uh, you know, it's just re recommended that job descriptions used, uh, clear, concise, non-technical language, and defining essential functions. Uh, and the description should uh, focus on the outcome, not the process to achieve that. So some examples would be uh, stationary position versus uh, stand or sit, move, uh, traverse versus uh, walk. Uh, you know, because there are some, uh, you know, a lot of jobs out there like uh, say a, uh, you know, administrative assistant uh, doesn't need to walk to the copy machine. Uh, it, you know, anybody, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 yeah, it, it could be, yeah, you can, if you're a wheelchair user, you can roll to the coffee yeah, machine. So, you know, th that kind of language is really just not necessary. Um, and, uh, you know, so again, we uh, do have a, uh, you know, samples, uh, uh, you know, uh, under various uh, appendixes uh, included in the plan. So, um, you know, during, uh, next is uh, maintenance of accessibility features. Uh, during the facility assessments, uh, you know, we noticed the number of, uh, uh, of uh, things that were in direct violations like items placed in front of dispensers, uh, operational buttons, uh, interior, uh, exterior doors with excessive uh, uh, operating forces and uh, closing speeds. Again, there is a, uh, you know, uh, a full list uh, in the actual uh, ADA plan. So, you know, just recommended that uh, facilities are uh, inspected regularly to ensure uh, compliance with uh, program accessibility and to initiate repairs and related actions uh, as required. Um, uh, next is effective uh, communications on auxiliary aids and services. Um, you know, just based on uh, what was submitted uh, in response to the ADA self-evaluation survey, it doesn't appear that, uh, uh, you know, that there are any, uh, uh, you know, accommodation uh, features uh, available, you know, just by looking at the, uh, uh, you know, uh, website and uh, various uh, documents. So, 
it's recommended that the town of Hadley add the following to all meeting agendas. If you need an auxiliary uh, aids or services for effective communication, such as sign language inter- interpreter, uh, assistive listening device, you know, uh, contact the ADA coordinator as soon as possible, uh, you know, uh, before the act, you know, the meeting itself. Um, and it's recommended that the town purchase an assistive uh, listening system, preferably a portable one that can be used for uh, meetings that are open to the public and be available as a, an accommodation request. Um, but, you know, all that being said, uh, some of the survey responses uh, 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 that came back uh, went from the uh, public library uh Say, you know, uh, stating the uh, library is equipped with assistive devices uh, for those with uh, hearing uh, and inter- for with uh, partial hearing, and interpretive uh, services can be requested and provided free of charge. The uh, Hadley Public School uh, survey response stated that sign language uh, interpretation is available, and the Hadley uh, Council on Aging. Uh, survey stated that assistive devices are available for people with uh, hearing loss, including uh, earpieces for rooms that there are speakers in a microphone system uh, for the dining room and an exercise room. Now, if, if that system is portable and, uh, it, you know, uh, that could uh, be used in uh, other areas like maybe the annual town meeting, but uh, no, I don't know exactly what this uh, assistive uh, device is. Um, and we're getting near the end here, uh, folks. Um, so website accessibility. Um, the town of Hadley uses uh, government uh, websites by uh, Civics Plus. And that is a, uh, it's, it's a very common, uh, you, know, uh, you know, website uh, host. And it's uh, very uh, uh, ADA and uh, screen reader friendly. In fact, a uh, visually impaired colleague of uh, mine using the most recent uh, edition of um, JAWS uh, screen reading software said uh, she was easily able to navigate the town of Hadley's uh, you know, website. She stated that all the uh, links are accessible as well as the actual content. Emergency preparedness evacuation plans, uh, uh, emergency shelters. Uh, it, it's, uh, there wasn't a whole hell of a lot uh, on the town's uh, website pertaining to this. So it's recommended that the uh, guidance uh, provided in Chapter uh, 7 of this document be followed when developing a uh, emergency management plan and more specifically that notification and assistance to uh, persons with disabilities be included within the plan. Uh, You may recall uh, Jim uh, talking about uh, the front end of the um, uh, ADA uh, plan. Uh, That that content is uh, in that section. And then finally, uh, polling places. According to uh, staff uh, within the town clerk's offices, all voting takes place at the senior center. And the senior center was uh, recently uh, constructed and is uh, readily accessible for people with uh, disabilities. The polling area includes uh, one lower and wider voting booth available for uh, people uh, that use wheelchairs or just find it easier to sit versus standing. And in addition, there is a uh, automark uh, voter assist terminal uh, available for voters that have uh, disability uh, disabilities, including people with visual impairments that enable them to uh, vote independently and in privacy. And I was told by the uh, town clerk uh, that uh, the uh, automark is uh, placed in such a way that the uh, screen is not visible to the uh, voting uh, public, that which ensures privacy. So that is the very, 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 very abridged uh, version of the uh, self-evaluation plan. And uh, uh, 
If uh, you have questions, you're uh, welcome to ask. If not now, it can be uh, any other time, as I had mentioned uh, before, that, you know, uh, once uh, this is complete, uh, you, you know, we're not uh, totally gone. Uh, you know, we're always available for questions. So thank you for uh, your time. And I'll uh, send you back to Jim. So I see you have three minutes, and I'll put it at 7, 8 RPM. Um, and I'm just going to go through general building findings, law compliance. I'm going to touch maybe a couple of buildings, some key ones. So in general parking, there are no they accessible parking spaces. Signs was too low or too high, or the running slopes were in excess of two percent, um, or there's no van accessible space. In many cases, the outside drop boxes or aerophone buzzers are too high, more than 48 inches above finished floor. That's the ADA standard. Or the accessibility to travel had excessive running slopes, or there were um, abrupt changes in level surface going to those those entrances. Um, Mike mentioned doors often had excessive operating uh, forces, five pounds interior, 15 pounds exterior, closed and fast, uh, less than six seconds. Steer railings were not round or oval in shape, lacked uh, top and bottom extensions, or in some cases lacked railings entirely on one or both sides. Um, not compliant knob style hardware, signage was missing, tactile um, signage, um, room designation signage, or it was um, at the wrong height or at the wrong location. Many things are not within reach range. Reach range is 48 inches under ADA. That was your light switches or, or other things, dispensers. In many cases, drinking fountains were not high, were not high and low. The drinking fountain, you need a high fountain and a low fountain. Uh, and in some cases, if the if the low fountain didn't have didn't have the adequate 27 inch minimum knee clearance. Uh, protruding objects, that's anything that's more than four inches from a wall surface on accessible to travel, a height of 27, 80 inches. So in many cases, there are, there are protruding objects. Um, and I'm not going to see if I can see one over here, but I can't up top of my head, so I point it out, but I can't. Um, service counters uh, were in excess of 36 inches, 36 inches of counter height for a service counter, 34 inches for a food counter. So some of your counters were in excess of that. Um, staff kitchenettes, and we had those at the library. Um, staff kitchenettes, which were too high or lacked knee clearance. So in the library, there were three kitchen, three, yeah, kitchenettes. I think there was two meeting rooms, a, a, a children's uh, community, and also staff room. They're not ADA compliant. Brand new building should be. Um, in many cases, the doorway thresholds um, again exceeded the the height requirement for unbeveled and beveled. Um, Hopkins Academy. A couple of quick things that were there problematic. Uh, I mean, there were many. Wait, there are many things problematic, but big ones. Um, there are bathrooms at level one electrical hallways. The only accessible bathrooms are down by the are, by the gym. You can't have ba if there are ba bathrooms are located in one wing or another section of the building. There must be also accessible bathrooms because it's discriminatory action to require someone to go from this part of the building way over here to get to the accessible bathroom. The similar situations in the town hall with bathrooms on the second floor. Um, and then uh, the accessible ones on the first floor. And because further compounded by the fact that the lift takes about a day to go from the top <laughs> to the bottom, um, you know, if I'm up on the second level, you do the bathroom, it's gonna cause a problem. The other problem with the lift is that chair lift, if it's in the, if it's in the open position, I can't get in with a wheelchair. And if I'm in a powered wheelchair, I can't, I don't use my, my hands, I can't really move that. So that wheelchair, that chair lift should be kept in the open position. Um, for someone to use. Jim, can I just, Amy, if, if you're okay with this, because we have our hearing schedule for 6 30, we have to start, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to take that long. If you guys want to wait, so if you guys have any questions, that's, I'm, that's, I'm if you're willing to stay. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. You want to stop it, open the hearing, and we can continue. Right. Then yeah. I can slow down my just, yeah. talk. Yeah. <laughs> you can breathe again. <laughs> yeah. I have the bathroom still doing it. I still have <laughs> no, no, I, I, no. So yeah, we can do that. You guys can just step aside. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Who do we have from Pride? Mm -hmm. Who is it from Pride? Um, it should be. Yeah, it's not there. Just says, uh, oh, Elena. Hi. Hi, Amy. It's Jennifer. Hi. Yeah. Elena. Hi. And um, so Jim Channing is here from the Pride. Um, okay. He's their attorney. He can speak to that license. Okay. Good evening. All right. 
Hi, Jim. Hi. You better announce that we're having a public so hearing. We're, maybe. I'm just going to open that we're we're opening up the public hearing. Um, Pride Operating LLC DBA Pride Number Six Zero Three has submitted multiple amendments to its existing off premises. Um, off-premise wine and malt license, including LLC manager and officers and license manager. Um, the proposed new manager is Elena uh, Gord Gordievsky. Is it El Elena or Elena? Elena. Okay. Again, good evening. <laughs> Jim Channing, attorney for Pride. Uh, local address 246 Cottage Street in Springfield, Mass. 01104. For your consideration, we have three proposed corporate changes and one proposed operational change. <laughs> With respect to the corporate changes, one, uh, there's no change of ownership. Pride Convenience Holdings, Inc. or LLC would still remain the owner. We're just proposing to take them off as an LLC manager. We are proposing to add our CFO and our executive vice presidents as LLC managers to Pride Operating LLC. And lastly, we're just offer, uh, offering up our uh, CEO to actually be listed as an officer with the Massachusetts database. Obviously, those three changes, as well as our proposed operational change, are all subject to your approval, as well as the approval of the ABCC. With respect to our license manager uh, proposed change, again, Elena's uh, here with me uh, via Zoom as well. Um, I'm happy to report that our current license manager actually got promoted. Uh, within the company. So it's not a matter of uh, needing to replace someone based on them leaving, but actually it's a, just a, a lateral change where Elaine has been a, a manager with uh, with us for quite some time. She's obviously, I don't want to speak for her, uh, but she's familiar with our responsibilities, the obligations, uh, especially obviously carding. She's TIP certified as well as all our employees are TIP certified as well. And again, uh, we'll be on site for over 40 hours a week. She again is on to answer any questions you may have um, here as well. Uh, but we appreciate your time tonight. All right. So, any questions? Uh, just Jennifer, uh, anything on your end that we should make note of? Or is everything uh, in accordance with your needs? Hi, Molly. Yes, all their license application is complete. They had submitted a few documents um, asking them to replace the original one. Um, I attached them there for y'all to review under executive content. Um, mm -hmm. But everything is in order and uh, we're ready to go. I'm, I move we accept the changes from the pride. Second. All right, motioned by Jane, seconded by Molly. Is there any further discussion? Um, we can do we can do all those in favor, right? You know the Joyce isn't here, or do we have to do roll call? No. Nope. No, we're good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Excellent. Thank you guys for taking the time to talk to us this evening. You're gonna appreciate it. Thank you. Have a happy holiday season. You, you too. too. You too. Okay. That was pretty quick. All right. So if you guys would like to come back and finish. Yeah. I agree. Breathe. Breathe. Slow down. If I can go back, something I just I skipped over, but just um Hopkins bathrooms. What's that? From Hopkins bathrooms. From Hopkins bathrooms, just almost back to the beginning. But there were just so on these transition plans when we do these. So there are tolerances that are allowed under both ADA and 520 CMR. Zero to two inches is one eighth of an inch. Two to 36 inches is half an inch and more than 36 is an inch. So for example, um, if something is a strict height of 48 inches and if it's 48 and a half inches, that's okay because that, that's within that greater than 36 one inch tolerance. So we measure stuff. So we don't include it, just that's fine. However, tolerances do not apply to slopes, cross slopes, running slopes. So a ramp is 8.3%, so it's 8.5%. Technically, it's too steep. We'll note it. I mean, we'll say, but we would we would, most, we would recommend, you know, seek a variance because for 2%, 0.2%, um, the benefit gained versus the cost, it's just, it's just not reasonable. So uh, we note that. They're, but they also don't apply for, um, so any range of dimension. So if you have a grab bar, 
in a bathroom. And it, the range is 33 to 36 inches above finished floor to the top of the gripping surface. If it's 37 inches or 37 and a half inches, it's too high. It needs to be lowered. Same thing with railings for a ramp, 18 to 20 lower, 34, 38 top. So it's not within that range. And again, because there's no, there's no tolerance, even if it's, you know, uh, 20 and a quarter inches on the lower ramp it's it's too it's too high so we have to know it now again in reality you know is a quarter of inch you're gonna but we we do know it so we leave it at that um there are areas where we address as a reasonable accommodation if required so there are some areas but particularly with dpw um police fire based on the nature of the positions um and many areas are closed to the public. So there, if there are things noted, in some cases, it may be only required as a result of a reasonable accommodation for us. That's detailed in the report. Um, and one thing to note, too, when this is something that we, you know, it, it, it's, we, we have to do schools. Schools can be a real, you know, bear because there are different standards. There's standards for pre-K, K to three. Um, four to six, and then seven to 12, that's adult. So there's four different standards depending upon grade level. And the standards, well, I shouldn't say grade because the difference, because um, ADA does it by age and 520 CMR does it by grade. And grades and age don't necessarily correspond. And also the the the, the, the um, standards between ADA and 521 for the, for the students are in sync. So it's, and we point that out here and then we, it, and, and it's overlap. We do the best we can. We'll note it. We're going to use this middle range if you've got, um, is what that recommendation should be. But that's more detailed than the report. Um, one thing I want to go back on Hopkins Academy, which is also, which, which was uh, a, a concern, the level one stairs, um, there's reduced headroom. There's no barrier. So if I'm sight impaired as a stairwell comes down, the bottom of the system down, I can I can walk into that and I can, you know, do some damage to myself. So typically there's a barrier, either a permanent or even temporary barrier, it could be planters, could be a fence, whatever, a gate rather fence uh railing that's erected below those. Um I mentioned the library, the sinks, I mentioned the other thing at town hall, which you don't want to hear, um, the exterior ramp, um, besides being um deteriorated. It has, it has excessive cross slopes, excessive running slopes. Running slope is 8.3% for a ramp. Um, it's 2% cross slope. And also it's three feet, four inches too long. The maximum run on a ramp before a level area is 30 feet. And it's 33 feet, four inches. So the ramp has got some major uh, issues. If it was only a foot too long, and we did a plan two or three years ago in the town of Uxbridge, um, and their ramp concrete ramp was 31 feet and they had a variance for that from the access board. One foot was no big deal. 3.4, three, almost three and a half feet. That's, that's a little, you know, that's getting a little bit long. Um, so again, common areas, we're going to back to some things. I'm going to go just on bathrooms in general. Um, we saw that COVID were typically always too high. Dispensers were too high. 42 inches is the height for a dispenser and 48 inches for a coat hook. In many cases, this, the piping below the sink was not wrapped, guarded, or insulated. Uh, I mentioned grab bars before. So in many cases, they were too high or too low or too far from the interior corner. It's um, six inches from the interior corner from the rear grab bar. 12 inches of the side grab bar, and they were not at the, at the proper, you know, setback requirements. In many cases, the toilet paper dispensers, toilet paper dispensers were too close to the front of the toilet or too far from the front of the toilet. They have to be seven to nine inches on center from the front. So again, it's easy for me to reach. Um, in many cases, we saw that the water closet uh, flush controls were on this wrong side. We have to be on the approach side, not the wall side. And in many cases, the clearances. So there needs to be 18 inches on, if I'm on a water closet, the toilet, 18 inches on center from the near wall, 42 inches on center from the far wall, 42 inches from the front of the toilet to whatever barrier or obstruction there is in front of that. And in many cases, those were not met at all. Um, we had sick mirrors that were too low. And then we had, so if faucets are metered or they have self-closing valves, um, then that same five pounds of operating force for an interior door applies. And also those um, valves must be open for at least 10 seconds. In many cases, you would just push it and like 
open for like two seconds and then it did shut off. We also saw in many cases there were urinals, had rims were too high. The maximum height is 17 inches. And I, I, I think off the top of my head, I, mean, I think there's something like 24, 20, 25 inches. Um, and as you pointed out, I incorrectly, we incorrectly noted the woman's um, stall over here, uh, that stall doors, and uh, not the door going in, but the stall door uh, for an accessible toilet stall, the doors must open in. I mean, it must open out, not in. It, um, they must be self-closing. And they also have, need to have pull devices on both sides of the door, especially if the stall door doesn't self-close and there's no interior of closing device, then I've got to try to reach down like this to the bottom of the stall door and pull it closed. And that's kind of, you know, that's a problem. Um, recreation areas in general, there are a lack of accessible routes of travel to and around facilities, playgrounds, lack of accessible equipment. Um, and we mostly saw there is wood chips. And we see this um. 90% of the time, wood chips throughout the entirety of you know, the playground surface. Wood chips um, may be accept acceptable as a fall zone uh, medium if it meets certain ASTM standards, but it's not an acceptable, accessible route of travel because for a wheelchair user, for someone with a walker or with or arm braces, I mean, there's too much drag. It's not firm, hard, stable. So again, there needs to be, and I referenced in the front end, we we have different types of materials that, that one can use. Could be stone dust, it could be rubberized, it could be, you know, it could be asphalt. But those are more accept ex, those are acceptable routes of travel, which chips is not. Um so I'm just going to brief, drill brief, just sidewalks and curb ramps. We really focused on Russell Street um, and then Middle Street. You know, overall, Russell Street was was in decent shape. There were some concrete pads which were heaving. We obviously didn't do the area because it was under construction down from going the right direction this way. Mm -hmm. um, although I came up this way just recently, I saw they had paved mm -hmm. most of it. But at, at the time, it was not. Uh, it was not. Um, so mostly focused on this area going towards Northampton. Uh, there were some. There was some concrete deterioration, I believe, over in front of the Russell um, School Building, former Russell School Building, uh, and a little bit of abrupt changes. And there were some crosswalks that didn't have detectable warning strips uh, at the curb ramps. Middle Street, different story, going towards Bay Road. Um, really, overall, very fair to poor condition. A lot of heaving deterioration. A lot of abrupt changes in level surface. Much due to the you know tree roots and you probably already know that you you walk um there was there were some gaps in asphalt broken asphalt deterioration excessive running and cross well not really running slopes in, in a short distance but cross slopes um running slopes typically if you're if you're you can't change topography but in cases there it's, it's mostly level at least on the left going towards bay but because of the roots, it's caused root upheaving. It's caused excessive um, abrupt change in level, and that, then also the, the, the running slopes. Um, there are a couple areas where you know the leaning trees have caused um, again the same reduced headroom of uh, walking on the sidewalk. So again, if I'm if I am sight impaired and, and using a cat, I can't pick it up. I'm going to walk into that you know the, the edge of that tree. Um, and the the curb ramps uh, throughout the entirety, except down by Bay Road, um, lacked uh, formal curb ramps, and he lacked detectable warning strips. So, I mean, this is much more detailed than the report itself. I mean, but this is just kind of a highlight. Um, as Mike, so we we would hope that you folks look at this. And um, I found a couple of little typos. Jane obviously found one. So we're going to make those changes. If you have others, and we'll we'll give it to let probably after the new year, and then um, do the final edits print out so you have your hard copies but in the meantime if there's like mike said we're here we have communities that we worked with two three years ago and they call us you know and um if we can't get out to that site if it's a travel we ask them you know we'll send us you know take some photos send us what you're doing or send us the plans send us we'll look at them or whatever it is or just call us and we have there's a facilities director the town of south Pearl. he calls on a regular basis uh you know so and it's just a quick phone call am i doing this right you know what's the measure for this for that so we're there here you know well after the fact to do that as well so if you're ready questions for either of us we're here now we're, we're going to be available we're available after the fact too some some of the um 
improvements that you've mentioned are not able to be done without funds. Are there any public funds available? Yes. So in the in the appendices, there is a listing of funding sources. Also, now that once you have the ADA plan complete, you can apply to through CDBG, through John, and actual for the constructions. And I'm trying to think, um, well, I'm going back to when I was at PVBC. We did many ADA very rural projects throughout the region. Um, you know, libraries, senior centers, town halls, it could be ramps, could be lifts, uh, you name it. Um, and also you can, so you can apply through also through MOD, Mass Office's Disability has an annual funding round to also do actual physical improvements. Um, that is issued in typically in September, it opens up through sometime in October, it closes, and then they make the awards in December. We're waiting right now for the FY20 four awards um, or, you know, John Scott's been telling the CDBG. So there are funding, there are, there are, yeah. um, and it does also, the other thing with the ADA plan, which is if there is other funding sources you're going for, open space and recreation. Um, I'm not sure the status of open space and rec plan, but they never not require you to have an ADA, you know, plan in place to look at your, your facilities. Um, if you're looking for uh, USDA funding, you know, for any kind of um, uh, improvements, they require to have an ADA plan done. And it also, uh, oh, I'm not gonna say set you up, uh, gives you gives you protection um, from, on the federal side, from the Department of Justice by this plan. Basically, this is your capital plan. And as long as you're making some good faith effort to chip away at it, if someone files a complaint, you can say, we have, we have an 88 plan, but we've outlined over the next, you know, seven to nine years what we plan on doing. And as funding comes available, we're trying to chip away at that. That gives you some protection from any kind of lawsuit as well. Thank you. So you mentioned Russell Street, right, which is under the control of the state. Right. So if there are issues on Russell Street, are, it, will the state be receptive to us saying, hey, there's... ADA problems here. Will you come and fix it? Um, I can't answer for the state. So, um, so you have no experience with that. You know, it, well, you, you you know how. You, <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know if this maybe took precedent yeah, over yeah. other things. Um, I got to watch what I'm saying in public, in public, <laughs> um, especially <laughs> I've worked in a public for many years. Um, you can point it out, and at that party, I think, the, the, to be honest, there weren't that many. The curb ramps would be the biggest things, and there were some areas where there was heaving on the concrete and all that. Um, overall, and then they, they, you know, it appears, I just did a drive-by, because the work, we were doing our field work, and it was, I think just recently, they probably did the the, uh, the paving here. And, and from what I could see, it looked, you know, busy, quick drive-by, you know, but... I think if there are things that are really that point pointed out, then the, the, you know that, those can be addressed. There are a couple of things I was already call, um, which I believe, believe which would be in your jurisdiction. And let me just quickly, um, okay, yes, okay, this would be in your jurisdiction. Um, and there's a third we didn't see, but I'm going to point it out after I address these. So uh, there are some areas where you, there was vegetative overgrowth onto the sidewalk, mm -hmm. and that restricted a clear width. There's also some place with a place of the mailboxes in the sidewalk, which restricted the clear width, 36 inch minimum clear width. So that could be under your jurisdiction in terms of place of mailboxes. What we didn't see, but we typically see on trash day, and this would be in your jurisdiction for setting a policy on this, is where did it, where did the uh, you know the trash bins go? Right in the middle of the sidewalk. So if I'm a mother pushing a you know uh, my uh, my cart with my child in it, or if I'm in a wheelchair, or if I'm with a uh, you know with a walker, I now have to find a way to go into the street, which is dangerous, but that's for dying, and then around to get back onto the street. So. Um, we didn't see it, but it wasn't trash day. So um, that'd be something to get your own to check. And if it is the case, then, you know, that's a policy that you cannot put your trash bins in, the, you know, the right of way of the sidewalk. So Carolyn, would the, I mean, I know they need to finalize the report, but would the next step be forming a work group or just parsing this out to the respective 
Department. So my initial thought is because I know some of this funding is you would need to um we need, I think the town needs to put a um ABA um, commission together because that I know in my former job that had to be put in place before I could go for money from the ABA. Mm -hmm. So that would be my recommendation. That would be the group. Um whether that's the, the charge to do this, that could be part of the charge. I'm sure mm -hmm. Jim will definitely give us guidance. I can talk to Jim for 25 years. <laughs> but then there are like some immediate things, like some of these were like HR related. So like Troy could immediately yes. start working yeah. on job descriptions and yes. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then getting it on the town meeting warrant. Yeah. For, okay. And again, if you look in the appendices, there are, again, we have the sample documents there. Um, and like Mike point out some of the language um, in in the job descriptions, but some of the basically like the reasonable accommodations, um, th there is a, a, a form to fill out, but also a policy. And that would be, to me, that would be a, a priority because if you don't have it, then if I say, well, you know, I, I, tr I have this and it was never addressed. Well, if you have it, well, did you fill out the reasonable accommodation form and then the default procedures? Because then... Then you go to the grievance process because then you're you being a resources person. Then it goes to AA court, and then it goes to you as the board to resolve it. And if the process isn't there, then the one has the ability to file a complaint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of work. Yeah. So, so thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you, Jim. Thanks, John. Thanks for the extra time too. So we have eight minutes. Do you want to try and do some public comment? Do you want to do some second Do you want to do public comments? Okay. All right. So there was a technical difficulty this past week with board docs, um, and the public comment section fell off on the internet. And I just noticed it this afternoon. Um, so we will still have public comment, and we can go ahead and do that right now. Um, is there anyone here for public comments not having to do with the young men's club? Because that would be a part of the public hearing, I think. It, I mean, they can do it, yeah. public, but and it would make more sense just to do it during the hearing. Yeah. So is there anyone here for public comments that isn't here for the young men's club I don't, public hearing? Uh, Alex is not manning that. He's going to be right back. Okay. Is there anyone physically here? Public comments not having to do with the Young Men's Club? And there's no one here for public comments on Zoom either. Okay. No one's been All right. Let's so let's do the consent agenda. I'm going, Jane. Okay. Settle down. All right. Um, consent agenda. Warrants AP 2422, AP 2422S, AP 24. 22 INS, AP 2423, AP 2423S. Motion to accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. All right, motion by Randy, seconded by Molly. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Um, we've got people here for committee appointments. Do you want to do those? Okay. Actually, you know, I think. So you want to uh, do climate there, change? That one should be quick. Yes, because some of these um, where you have vacancies, you're, you you might have people here. Who okay. You might want to talk. Um, so we do have um, a letter of interest for the climate change committee, and that's Kathy Nagella, former Hopkins Academy teacher. And um, I had her. For a couple of classes. Um, and so she is interested in joining the Climate Change Committee. Um, Motion yeah. to appoint Kathy Nagella to the Climate Change Committee. Second. So, all right. Uh, motion by Molly. Shh, excuse me. Can, sorry, we're in the middle of a meeting. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you and welcome to the Climate Change Committee. <laughs> we'll just need you to get sworn in at the clerk's office whenever you get a chance. Okay. Um, we can do the resignations and withdrawals pretty quick. I'll just read that off. 
Um, the following resignations have been submitted and are currently in the process of looking for replacements. Um, town Treasurer's Office, Assistant Town Treasurer, Sarah Fairbanks, Human Resources, Human Resources Assistant, Shelby Lombard, Police Department, Officer Jacob Marini, Dispatch, Stephanie Rivera, and Hadley Media, Production Assistant, Patrick LaBelle. So there's no vote on that, that's information nope, only? just information only. Okay. Um, and then also, there are library trustee vacancies. Um, so the select board and the library trustees are seeking interest, interested residents um, to fill two vacancies that were left by resignations. So if there's any interest in uh, being a library trustee, uh, please send an e email to info at hadleyma.gov by January 4th. Uh, 24. 2024. These are joint appointments by the select board and the library trustees. So again, if you're interested in <clears throat> joining that, info at hadleyma.gov. Um, also, the uh, select board and the Hadley Housing Authority are seeking interested residents to fill the vacancy left by a resignation. Um, again, if you're interested in joining the ha Hadley Housing Authority, uh, email info at hadleyma.gov. And this one is by January 11th. It's a joint appointment by the select board and the housing authority. All right. Um, little bit of Amy. Yeah, might as well wait. just wait a second for that. Yeah, uh, well, well, you have a minute. You, you have, you have yeah. time. Really, what I sit here was the question. <laughs> Thanks. We don't want you to punch in anything. <laughs> All right, it is seven o'clock. Um, so we're gonna open the public hearing continuation for the Young Men's Club. The Young Men's Club has applied for an alteration of premise for their club license at 138 East Street. This is a continuation of the original public hearing that was scheduled for December 6th. We have Mr. Reedy here. Showtime. Perfect. Okay, for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst here on behalf of the Young Men's Club, as the chairwoman noted uh, in their application for an alteration of the premises uh, over on East Street. And so just for clarity, as I'm sure the board knows, but maybe more for the public, all we're looking to do is alter the existing Section 12 club license. And so this is what allows club members and their guests uh, gives them the license to sell and to imbibe alcohol within the licensed premises. Um, the premises currently is really just the building and what we're looking to do. You know, we've been here, I think, since June. And so this has been part of the discussion is let's let's bring it into conformity with what the club actually wants to use the land for. Um, and so we're changing the license premises to include the building, the deck, the pavilion, the parking area, the basketball court. And I think we had provided to your licensing coordinator a diagram and I uh, put my best Randy Eiser hat on and tried to uh, describe the, the bounds of that licensed premises. 
um but it's it's on the westerly side of the property kind of the northwesterly side of the property and so that's all we're looking for tonight is to alter the premises to expand it to include that area um it does not it's only for club members and guests this does not include the land to the east where the ball fields are and where those large public events have been held that would be and that will be something different it's a section 14 license that we'll be submitting in the next, I would say, couple of weeks to be in front of the board. Um, we'd expect conditions to be put on that license should the board ultimately grant um, those one day special licenses. So just to be clear, we're only talking about the club license, um, members and guests, and in the area that we talked about, and this effectively excludes all of that to the east. And last time I was here, we talked about um, that the the town and i had talked with the executive director of the abcc to confirm that this was a suitable uh, way to move forward for the entire property where you could separate it and have section 12 on a portion and section 14 on another portion so the ask tonight is just to alter that section 12 premises okay um i was actually going to start uh, i know joyce couldn't be here tonight um, but she did send me something to read for her. Um, so in Joyce's words, I'm in support of them using the deck for food and drinks during club hours until 10 p.m. when they are open. This would follow the pavilion's time for ending events such as it is outside. Um, I also do not have a problem with the license including the property between the club and pavilion as this is used for car shows once a week and they have played horseshoes out there as well. So the license would cover the property from the club to the pavilion and include the deck. Any other large venues such as country in the country would need a one day liquor license and be used on the property beyond the pavilion and would need to follow guidelines set forth by the select board. The young men's club is an important part of our community. They have been established long before my time. They have forever been generous to our schools with the use of fields for soccer and baseball. They allowed use of the pavilion for so many chickens to go to raise money for athletic and band uniforms. Um, it was known for a while as th I was known as <laughs> I was known for a while as the chicken queen, but we always had so many people who participated in this and men who cooked. They donate to the food pantry, give scholarships, and donate to other causes in our town. So these are a few reasons as to why I support this club. Thanks for sharing for me, best Joyce Chunglo. Terrific, thank you. So I have a question about the use of the pavilion and, and a club license and how they interact. When you rent the pavilion to John Steibeck, He's not a member and he does not invite members and yet they serve liquor there. How does that fit in if this is under the club license? So as being under the club license, he would have to be a member in order to use it. I mean, that's so they couldn't rent it to people who were not club members. Correct. Section 12 is members and guests, which is that's why the important distinction, especially leaving, you know, put it another way, this area could never be used for because you can't mix a section 14 and a section 12. Right, right. So by putting this just in section 14, it's precluding its use as a, uh, putting it in section 12, I'm sorry, is precluding its use as a section 14. So, you know, what would be helpful, whether it's you, Tom, or, or Maybe you know, some of the, the club yeah. members, um, it would be helpful for me then to understand because that, that would be a change then, right? I mean, so, so, by um, requesting the expanded geography, what would be different if this license is granted versus what has been happening up until this point, I guess? Sure. Everybody on the property would have to be an active member. Well, no, everybody that rents it yeah. has to be an active member. So, so let's say I wanted to have a wedding party. You cannot rent the building unless you're an active member. Right. So I would have to come and say, hey, guys, could I join? You have to get <laughs> And then, okay. Yeah. Okay. So to continue with that, is there a limit to the number of guests a member can have? I don't believe so. 
at least as far as the law is concerned, there there may well, be that's, some that's rules or regular. No, yeah, the no. law is what I'm concerned no. with right now. There's nothing. So there is no limit. So to Molly's point, if she wants to have a wedding party there, she's going to go <coughs> get a membership, and then she can have 400 guests. Those are all her invited guests, and therefore she would be allowed, they would be allowed to be served and drink alcohol on the premises. Yes. Okay. Because up until now, I mean, obviously it's been used for, you know, Jack and Jill's and wedding functions and political gatherings and all of that. So that would be a different. Yeah. Okay. And something that got brought up, the, the deck and the actual club building, there is a occupancy limit that even though the deck is bigger than the building itself, the occupancy limit is still the same as I understand it, which I believe is 99. 99. Okay. And then you have to section off the deck so that somebody can't walk from the deck down the stairs. I believe that's state law, but I'm not positive. Under, for a, for a license? I, no. No, it, it wouldn't have to be that way. I think it might have been because of the way their license as it currently sits is structured where they couldn't go out on the deck. And so that, that was actually an excluded part of the premises. What we're trying to do is correct all that to include it. So they should have free flow between the building, you know, occupancy level to the side, just as far as the license and the free flow, flow under the license would allow them, they could go between and amongst building and deck. So I see a conflict. All right, so I understand that, and that makes sense because it's a nice day. You want to be outside the park, but if you're going to still have the car show, only one member has to invite all of these people that are otherwise unknown to the club. Is that correct? Well, not necessarily. Yeah, I mean, if ninety-nine percent of the car show people are members, anyways. I mean, I would say if you went there on any given Monday night, you'd ask anybody who's a member, they could provide information that I'd say probably almost 100% of them are. Okay. Next question. Okay. If the pavilion is no longer in use when you have your one day events that we're going to talk about later, are you going to have enough space to have the same numbers of people you had before without using that internal space between the pavilion and the club? Right now, what we use that pavilion for is EMT station, check-in for guests coming in. So we don't serve alcohol there anyway, so it's a moot point for that. So it doesn't matter. It's only, it's only function for every one of those parties has been, especially country to country, has been for inventory and stuff, yeah. So I guess the question, the question I have, um, and again, I'm, I'm sure there are people here who are going to want to speak to this, but so just putting myself in the, in the neighborhood shoes and, and I guess, I mean, I, I feel right now, like everybody's acting in good faith and trying to kind of write what was wrong in the past on a variety of fronts. It just evolved over time, you know, so we're trying to get that squared away. Um, I think the addition of the the deck, you know, that happened during COVID, I think, right? right? So it really hasn't been in use much. And I would imagine if I were a neighbor, I'd be a little bit worried about an uptick in noise. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about like the hours that would be in use? Um, and if there's entertainment, I'm assuming you'd have to have a license. Entertainment license. Right. So that would be, again, under our back in front of you. Yeah. I mean, there's I'll let them talk about the hours in a minute, but there are I mean, this is a license, right? So it's it's granted at your will. You can put restrictions on it. You can call us back like you had done previously to say, hey, wait a second. You're not acting in good faith anymore or what have you. So and it's an annual renewal, as you know, for all of these licenses. So it's not something that once it's given it's given in perpetuity. There's always that ability that you have to rein if there's something happening beyond what you'd expected uh, the club back in to have that conversation or to revoke, suspend, modify, et cetera, any of those licenses. So I'll turn to you guys for the for the hours. I mean, our intentions for the deck when it was built 
was literally for the daytime hours. You know, people want to go out there and relax in the evenings. I mean, our intentions aren't to have parties out there until 10 o'clock at night. There's not, we don't have like live bands, nothing planned on that. It's basically in a nutshell, we've abided by the 10 o'clock rule for the pavilion. That's going to be the 10 o'clock rule for the, you know, outside the deck. There's not going to be any issues with that for noise complaints that I can see. If there is, we will correct them and go from there. And the 10 o'clock, that's seven days a week? Yeah. So one of well, those. Will, not Monday, but. When I pulled the permit to the deck, I talked to Tommy and Mike about it. And it was just for seating. For dinner, we served food till nine o'clock. So really, you might have somebody go out there. We have no smoking on the deck. So people won't be out there smoking on the deck, chit-chatting and stuff. Dinner time, that's pretty much it. We're not going to have any bands out there yeah. or anything like that. We have music inside, that's it. So, yeah. but we're pretty low key, but neighborhood. And so maybe if I could, if it pleases the board a condition that there shall be no live entertainment on the deck, right? Just something like that, if that's a concern. So, with a club license, we can put the same kind of restrictions on it that we can put on a one day license? I think you're probably a little bit more. Um, no, Jane, you cannot. It's it's not the same. There's more limitations. Limited. <laughs> section, 12, yeah. section 12. So they have internal music in the clubhouse. Is there anything that says they can't put the speaker out on the deck? I mean, I think if you've got a representation I think it would from these folks saying they won't do it, then you've got it. It's on. It's in the meeting minutes. Call us on it if it happens. Yeah, this is just a point. When people come in and set up a band, they have their amplifiers and stuff inside yeah. of our clubhouse. Nothing is outside. And then would you, because um, again, it's this is going to be different. So there's going to be nerves <laughs> on, on both sides, right? You know, trying to figure this out. Um, have you thought through as, a, I guess, a board, um, you know, some sort of mechanism to kind of formally say to the, I'm going to say the neighbors, you know, in particular, look at if you have any problems, this is how we want you to communicate them so we can address them before it becomes a bigger issue. No, you... The only time we've talked is, is yeah, through here and heard their concerns. Um, we have sat down and we have done this for a long time. Um, I, did, I do see there was an issue in the last year and then maybe the year before that. Um, we have sat down as a board and talked and we do understand and know where we made a mistake as to why the noise was so bad. Um, we know where we placed bars in the past that haven't been an issue. So as far as the last two years that we've done it, we talked about not putting bars in front of the pavilion. Everything's going to be behind the pavilion. Um, that'll help the noise stay down. Everything's going to be shooting towards the backside of Sam's pretty much where the open field is uh, towards Moody Bridge Road. So we've, we've looked into it quite a bit to find out where the faults were and we pretty much have it locked down now. And let me just, and that's, I know that's a separate. So, yeah, so I was just going to say to Sean, so we'll, that's more, that's yeah. the events. We'll be back for that. But I think what well, I'm just Molly is talking about it. That, yeah. If there's a noise issue, we built it so we can construct a barrier wall if there is excess noise. Oh, that was my question. Yeah. I, we'll rip it. We're not going to, we don't want to irritate the neighbors. We don't want to make it a place where people are sitting there having dinner and a drink and a neighbor comes over and complains for them. So, you know, we have cameras out there. We'll monitor it and you know, keep an eye on going on. And I think to that end, so I think what Ms. Keegan is saying is maybe think about coming up with a, hey, we'll, we'll send out a mailing to the neighbors so they have our email or our number. So if they, you're the first line instead of them going to police or select board, just it's going to help the communication. And, and historically, when we've had events, I know I've gone to the neighbors and talked to them prior to certain events we had. I know Frank Quadra has stopped in their house and, and talked to me about certain events that we had. Um, but, you know, him being here. But the immediate neighbors, I've definitely gone around and, and as a board, we've gone along and spoke to them. Mm -hmm. so. But yeah, I think, you know, Attorney Reedy's captured what I'm thinking. I think, you know, that would go a long way to show good faith. I think that, but as it's been said, 
a phone number that you will answer during an event if somebody has Ooh. a problem. That could be provided. Which everybody has yep. that I spoke to. I get my personal cell phone okay. number. Okay. And Good. Okay. And just to be clear, Mr. Reedy, you, you're, the club is suggesting that they are going, whatever they're going to do in this modified licensed area is going to comply with their previous approved permit from the ZBA, correct? Yes, 100%. Okay. Okay. Um, the there are two outstanding invoices, I believe. Mm -hmm. By our, they're all yeah. taken care of. They're they done, are. They are all. Yes. Okay. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't know. Okay, well, that's good. I appreciate that. I'm gonna check myself. Oh, good. Okay. I was like, it was just on here for me to. They're out there. Okay. Um, so hang on one second. Um, are we done discussing amongst ourselves the alteration? And can I open it up to public? We're done for now. For now. Yeah. Like for now. Yeah. Yeah. Like so we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if there is anyone here that from a, a public standpoint that would like to talk, I'm just going to kick you out for a little bit. Mr. Reed, the parts of the microphone. Um, could you repeat the provisions of this map versus the back lot? So, in other words, this is, if I understand it correctly, and what I'm looking for you to speak is out the um, map that you need. Presented. Yeah, so that's part of the license application. And so right. if altered. So what you're asking here is that this would be deemed the Section 12 club license. Club, club. license. So that's members and guests. There, It wouldn't be country to country, spring fest, fall fest. That could not occur on this portion of the premises. So you could not call in. Correct. Okay, so in the, the east, the back was country and country or event would happen. Correct. And we would, if we end up with a Section 14 license for each of those events from the select board. So there's still, that's a whole, and that's why I tried to distinguish it, that's a whole separate path that we have to go down. For those events in that back portion with the salon through the chair. How do you propose that they're segregated and you don't get home during the event? So they to, for them to do the event, they'd have to get an entirely different license. They'd have to come before the select board, and those the events can't occur until they come here to us. So yeah, was, right now they don't have the opportunity to even have an event until we go through phase two of this. I think part of your question is something we have asked for in the past for events and that is fenced area. Which is what we have. We've water. done for everyone. And so I expect when we come back that will be right. one of the conditions that you know assuming we get approval that would be imposed to have that separation to be a, a would it for anything in that middle area. You can park so, it and you can't serve alcohol. <laughs> Yeah, so essentially right now, um, what we're talking about for the map is the blue outlined area. That's going to be only what is under the club license. Anything outside of that area is a completely separate entity, a completely separate um, liquor license, one day liquor license that would have to come through us at the time or before the time of those events. And so, be conditioned. And be conditioned. So as of right now, what we would be voting on or discussing tonight is the alteration to the blue outlined area as their new premise. Because um, as of right now, it's like the events aren't happening, essentially, until you come back. Yes, correct. Is there a way to filter the blue area? Meaning... It's club. 
But, you know, I'm, and I'm thinking of vehicular traffic. The blue line right on your map is the curb line on East Street. So potentially, potentially somebody could have a couple of beers and stumble out into the road. Senior. Or stumble out into the paved parking area and be hit by a pavement. Presently, you can't serve alcohol or consume alcohol outside of the clubhouse. Mm -hmm. the so there is this long buffer where people are staying protected. And that is imposed a filter, so to speak. Like a setback? So people, right? Like the neighbors, the people that are across the street. I'm sure the patrons of the young men's club have their own type of game. Good Sometimes things get out of hand. So the neighbors, especially across the street, they're watching it. It's in their front, front yard, so to speak. So I'm asking is, is there a way to filter this so that maybe we're talking about the backside of the pavilion back or Traffic, so to speak. Tom, do you, I have, think we're do you have a full scale map? Because all I get on my computer is three quarters of it, and I can't tell how far towards East Street the blue line goes. I've got to go off. Like this. Yeah. Let's <laughs> go right up against the curb. What if I see? Really? Map. Yeah, okay. But then it goes all the way to East Street. Yeah. Yeah. Might even be You can hold on to that if you want. Oh, thank you so much. So, one of the things that's probably going to be on this from the building straight across, because one of the issues we have, we have a porch league that's been going on for 30 something years. People get drinks inside the bar, walk out to the horseshoe. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's not a large parking lot. Nobody races through there. It's not like they have small, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty condensed. Yep. So, to, to Mr. Aquadro's point, I would suggest that the front of the building, the blue line go to the front of the building, not to the street. East street. Like, yes, or like to the deck, the end of the deck. Yeah, so, so from the deck, deck yeah. the building goes to the, right. yeah. the building and deck right line. Yeah. So if you made a straight line there. It's like there's a the setback that you can yeah. link between here and the road. I think that makes sense. For yeah, the purposes. And that's... Um, so please, please understand that you know all of this came about because things got a little crazy, got out of hand. It was you know the alcohol was one issue, the noise was one issue, the vehicular traffic, the number of people. So the, the neighbors all had to adapt. And obviously, you know, there are some of us that are irritated that it got out of hand and we're here now being, we're trying to find a concession, but we also want from the neighbor side, we're looking for a little more respect in downsizing some of this for our, <clears throat> for our benefit. It is a, a, a residential neighborhood and you are a, a club or a social club, I presume. If you're right. not a social club, or you, you're not operating as a tavern and, and not operating as an event venue, then it shouldn't you know, it shouldn't have these mega events and things should be scaled down. Um, so I just wanted to do a point of uh, clarification and like for the record, just for you two, just to say your names and then your positions for the oh, club. Yeah, I'm Sean Gould, I'm the president. John Mishkowski, Junior Treasurer. And then- um, I'm Frank Quadro. I'm a resident okay. on East Street. Yep. Sorry, just so that we could, anyone that's on the line. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. So before you talk, Thank just you. grab a microphone. You're not going to hear it in here. It's more for those who are online so that they can hear. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, just grab a microphone and then just say your name. Yeah, my name is Lee Kane. I'm at 130 East Street. And uh, I'm, I don't really know anything about the young men's club and i was wondering if you could tell me what are the uh requirements for membership you're opening an area up to members and guests what are the limits of membership uh you have to be 21 years old to join <laughs> if you're a hadley resident it's a cheaper rate than if you are a non-hadley resident once you come in uh you get size sponsored by a member that's there it goes to the board of directors on our monthly meetings we vote on who you are, it votes you in. Once you get voted in, then you become a member. Are there any limits to the number of members you can have? There is not. So, like, all of the UMass students could be members? Correct. Well, that's a concern to me. If you have a whole entire area toward the front of the property where... Well, we've been, we've, been in, we've been in business for, since 1939, and we have not had any more than five to 700 members, and we're not going to sit there and go promote flyers to UMass and they can be good members. Well, I, mean, I, I, I'm getting, you know, I had the idea that yeah. like the rear of the property would for events was for events, but now you're saying you could have 700 people in the front of the property and so, the guests, right? So speaking on, I think what you're trying to get to about the larger events, that's a separate license. We're not looking, we are looking for the club license we don't have 700 person parties in the front of the house. You actually can't right. do more than whatever the occupancy limit is anyway. Well, that's yeah. correct. That's in the building. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. So we have a pavilion, yeah. but in the pavilion, we have a certain occupancy that we can have in there. You can't fit. I think it seats 250 people at max. So I think the gentleman's concern is that let's say tomorrow a thousand people decide they want to become members of the club. We got to turn away because we can't have No, no, you can. No, you can accept. You the, can accept the membership. Right. The and then somebody has a party, and then you have a thousand people. And and this is hypothetical. I please right. bear with me. That's the concern. So that's what I think you need to address that. Right. So the concern being, which I understand what you're saying. Our pavilion only holds so many people. We have a pavilion coordinator. When she books parties, how many people are coming? There is a limit on the people because we only have a certain size bar in the pavilion that we can only handle so many people. So is there a number limit? If I want to have a, a wedding reception at the club, am I limited to how many people I can invite? I would say when you deal with the, the coordinator, there is. But so, you, you don't know what that number is? I don't know personally what that number is. Okay. I know what the parking lot can hold. I know what we can manage mm -hmm. in the pavilion. Yeah. So there's only so many people you can get. Okay. We all have heard about parties who start and then other people come because they hear about it. And even though that may not be what he planned for his party, everybody wants to be at his party. And so we all show up. So that being said, I think the largest party we've had, which was a fundraiser for a gentleman who got injured in a tow truck accident. And then this past summer, we had a benefit for uh, the kid that got killed over in Hatfield. I think there was 400 people max at both those parties. And th those are large events. Again, it's what the property can hold. Yeah. Can we stipulate a number for this area? Well, uh, can I say something first? Because I, I hear, I'm a little confused because I thought this uh, blue zone was open to guests and members. And then I, I hear you talking about the pavilion and particular parties. So could you clear that up for me? Pavilion's in the blue area. It's on the photo. It's the... No, I know where the pavilion is, but I'm just... So 
if we have a two different kinds of events, two different kinds of things that could oh, happen. like standard operating in the club versus the yes, it's it's all one property. So under the new regulations, license we're going for, that whole blue area covers the club and pavilion. So during most events, the people who normally come into the club go to those events. We can only hold 99 people in the club. So if there's 500 people out back, 400 people, they can't all come into the club because we can only hold 99. Okay. I, I just, uh, a few minutes back, you were talking about uh, club members and their guests could be in that blue zone. And now you're talking about pavilion events. <clears throat> a a sounds... pavilion event is rented by a club member. So to rent the pavilion, you have to be a member of the club. So if you're a member of the club, you rent the pavilion, say you have a wedding or a Jack and Jill, wedding for 250 people, you can have 250 people back there. So a, a, a member of the public who wants to rent the pavilion for a wedding cannot do that. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. You have to be a member of the Young Men's Club. They could join the club and then have the... the Correct. And, and to be clear, weddings and things of that nature are allowed by their existing permit. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, I think you understand what the concerns of the neighbors are. I think you want to... And you know that there'll be scrutiny. So I guess we'll go with yeah, that. I was, I was going to say, I think that, um, so just for clarification, under the current license, um, it covers the pavilion and the clubhouse as entirety. And what this is doing is just opening the space um, to include the horseshoe area, the basketball court. Um, in, that, in the parking area. In the parking area. And the deck. Well, yeah, the deck. Because that was it wasn't the deck wasn't on the original permit, right. but right. it was an addition that is attached to the clubhouse. Correct. Mm -hmm. You got another question, um, maybe. Yeah, is it well, oh you and you have the microphone. Perfect. Go ahead and just uh say your name. David Olson. I live at 128 Bay Road, which is across the field from the from the young men's club um i i have some clarification questions about the about how the law works in this case um uh, as i was reading through various descriptions of the laws for the private club is it is it true that that well the way it's stated is that members may be served and guests of members may be served but guests must be introduced to the bartender by the member and can only be served while that member is present. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And I don't know that it says bartender, but the J yes, that's the, yes. Okay. Um, can be introduced by mm -hmm. a member. I don't think it's okay. necessarily to a bartender, but and, and they can only be there while and be served while the member who introduced them is there. Okay. I, I mean, that doesn't sound like introducing 250 people. It sounds like bringing a friend to the club. There's no limitation. But that's not. Okay. okay. Um, th I, uh, I also read that uh, if you have a Section 12 license, that the local authority cannot restrict the hours uh, with which you, uh, during which you can serve alcoholic beverages uh, between I think 10 a.m. and 11 p.m. that 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 uh, that they cannot place restrictions on that. So I think it's between. Um, I'd have to look, but there's a, a prohibitive period through which you can't serve. I think just under the general laws, and I can get the citation that you cannot serve. Um, but otherwise, and I think what they're saying is they'd be this willing to limit to because their special permit. I think allows them to go till 10. They're saying here, 10 p.m. Okay. All right. That, Sorry, would you say that again? Do you you're understand? You're at 10 p.m.? So historically, we've closed the pavilion bar at 10 p.m. The bar, yeah, the pavilion bar okay. closes at 10 p.m. 
and the clubhouse closed. And it's 1 a.m. It's a bar. 1 a.m.? Correct. Um. So let me ask a stupid question. Since the pavilion and the clubhouse are now all in this new zone, are we gonna are you gonna continue to work on the 10 o'clock, one o'clock? Correct. Because yeah. currently pavilion is 10 o'clock. Right. We're we're allowed to. That's I'm just asking. Yeah, no, I and I get what you're saying. We're not looking to expand hours back there. I mean, we have respect for the neighbors to that where 10 o'clock music's off. We last call at 9.45 or no. Yeah. Would the deck fall under that? The deck, as we said earlier, would be 10 o'clock because of the noise. We don't want people out there. As I said, the kitchen closed at 9 o'clock. So, yeah, we're not promoting people hanging out and doing stuff out, outside, making noise for the neighbors. Thank you, Mr. Olds. So to so touch on that point, what I think you guys are trying to say is we're not rezoning to try to have bigger parties for regular events. We're literally trying to tie all this into one thing for the deck and the 10 o'clock license or the 10 o'clock ordinance we're going to abide by for everything outside. There's not being rezoned to have thousand person parties. It's being rezoned. I understand. I, I yeah. understand the two zones. Yep. So it, we'll operate on the 10 o'clock PM. Get your understanding of what you want to do yes. relative to inside the yep. building, inside the clubhouse, outside of those structures. So the neighbors have an idea yep. that hey, at 10 o'clock. We can shut the deck down at 10 o'clock. Absolutely. Done. That won't be a problem. So, so would it be fair to say that after 10 o'clock, the only drinking allowed will be inside the clubhouse? Yeah, we can put a sign on the door saying we can shut down. But I think that's what their concern is. So, but here's the thing. I mean, as friends, let's say if you came in for a drink, yeah, we want to go on the deck. It's a nice night. Have a small conversation. We're monitoring the noise. We're not going to let people be loud and unruly on the deck. But if you want to go out there and sit by yourself and have a beer, I don't think you should be limited to that. You know, we'll monitor it. And again, this is, if you guys have a complaint as neighbors, hey, they're on the deck, they're being loud, you can bring that back to the board and we can renegotiate it. You can call us and say, hey, you're doing this. We'll change it. I would, from my perspective, I would like you to say or understand that anything outside of the clubhouse closes at 10 o'clock inside the clubhouse is one o'clock which you presently have and i don't think the neighbors are going to come over one or two guys are out there having a quiet conversation and finishing the beer i don't think anybody's going to be you know be, be that straight. We've actually had a neighbor come from Spur Road at two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon complaining because two people are having a beer on the deck. Well, so, you have to understand that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just saying, it's it, it, yeah. I don't want to put a limit on it because we're handcuffing ourselves. We're, we're not looking to do something to make an impact in the neighborhood that's going to be unruly, irritate the neighbors. But again, like you said, if if so, what you're saying is put a limit on ten o'clock. But if one guy or two guys go out there and has a quiet beer, if the oh, new I'm enforcement sure. officer comes over, it, we get fined. Well, so I, it's a I catch think twenty-two. It's an easier rule. It's plain inside is one, outside is another. And yeah, somebody can be difficult and come and say, "Well, you're drinking on the on the deck," but you know today. There hasn't been a lot of enforcement because it's, it's gone on for a long, long time. So I think that's the reason that they're looking to change this so that everything is in compliance. I think that was the whole purpose of this. Well, I was going to say, can we just check with Jennifer? She's a licensing coordinator and make sure she has the times that she needs in the... Jennifer, are you still there? I'm here. Um, at the time will need to be defined for the outside deck. It has it has to have something defined on it. There's times on all of the things, 
it has to be done. So, no. No. Um, I mean, personally, um, I would say since the deck is attached to the building that it should follow the building of, you know, because it's not intended as an entertainment space that it would be included in the, the, the 1 a.m. as it being part of attached to the, the structure. And it seems like it's the noise, right? It's not Correct. necessarily it's being outside. Yeah. It's, it's the noise. That's the issue. And so is there a way to say if it gets to be a problem, then there'll be mitigating mitigating measures. And you may even want to think about right. So putting Jenna, up something right now. Uh, so we don't well, need, Jennifer, know. are you still on? I'm, yep, trust me, I'm here. So two other bars have outside decks. Arizona Pizza and the Quarters. Do they have limits on their outside drinking? I'm not going to pull their licenses up right now, but no. I believe there are limits on theirs. Um, also, I would just ask if y'all would check in perhaps with uh, William Dwyer, with Bill Dwyer or Jim Maxmowski about having outside in the residential area since y'all aren't zoned. It's not a commercial area. I would just, I would just think it might be a good idea to just to check in on that since it's residential, not um, commercial. So, and from I, my research, here, so that would be a good choice. From my research, quarters does not have a limit, and they have more of a college crowd, louder, rowdier crowd than we have. But they're not residential. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're in a business. Both of those other bars, hang on. Both of those other bars you're talking about are in a business zone. So you have special considerations here. Yep. So what I'm hearing is the noise concern is is what you, you're worried about, right? Yeah, that, yeah. So at any point in time, if we decide to grant them the same hours on the deck, as inside the clubhouse at any time it, within the, the, the year after we grant, if we grant the license, we can call them back and say, hey, there's complaints. We're telling you, you cannot be on that deck after whatever time. I believe we have the ability to do that. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Mr. Reedes? Yes. They, they, they yeah. seem to be acting in good faith and i realize that words are cheap we have to see what's going on i'm not suggesting that you guys are here blowing smoke at us uh so I mean, we have we have the ultimate control here if they're not going to behave as they're telling us they're going to then we have to do something about it and i am more than willing to do something about it if we get to that point Hi, I'm Mike Duffy. I live at 128 Bay Road. I'm in a butter. And uh, one concern that I'm hearing out of, out of this, uh, well, first of all, we're originally concerned about the whole size of it, but I think it's alleviated a little bit by uh, some of the decisions. But there's no, it doesn't seem to be any limit on the number of people, a written limit and the number and the size of events that can be held. Uh, it's by, they're saying the number of seating and the pavilion or whatever, but that's not part of the legal agreement that we have with them. I think it would be too well for the neighbors if the select board were to put some maximum limit on the size of events that can be held. Thank you. Uh, David also get the 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 last question I had was about the limit the capacity we have there's a limit for the clubhouse there's a limit for the pavilion but now we're including that entire area in premises so is there a limit for that no I don't think we're we're not talking about the the easterly side, I think we're talking about the area between the clubhouse and the pavilion and just, just that open area. 
And I, I don't know that there, I mean, where an occupancy limit deals with fire code, building codes, et cetera, clubhouse, pavilion, actual capacity, you're probably dealing with something that's like uh, public health, safety, and welfare. And you're, you're probably thinking about, you know, and I don't know if it's, you guys say, if there's an event over 400 people, we'll get a crowd control coordinator or something like that, or we'll, we'll work with the police department. You know, I think it comes down to something where there are other enforcement authorities in town who can say, well, geez, this just doesn't look safe on the one hand for public health, safety, and welfare. And if there is some um, um, nuisance, you can probably also send the police there and say, hey, listen, you guys are just being too loud. And so for that outdoor area, I don't want to say it's self-regulating. It doesn't have those strictures of building code, fire code, like the pavilion in the clubhouse would have. Um, and so I think it's up to you guys to think about, is there some number without limiting yourself too much, but where you could say, okay, if it reaches this, then we'll have that conversation with police and maybe we get a, a crowd manager. Um, and then, like I said, the, the police and fire would have the ability to come in if there was an issue. My concern is that it will, there'll be an event and it will happen without the plan and say, we need to have this coordinated. It's, we're having a fundraiser for something that's a good cause and everybody wants to support it. And it's going to be at the Young Men's Club. Let's go. Hey, you want to come with me? Bring your friends. There's a party down the Young Men's Club. Are you a member? I will be. <laughs> <laughs> so to address that, I'm a retired firefighter, Lieutenant, 30 years on Hadley Fire. I've worked with Mike Spanky, Mike Mason, any large event, I always reach out to them, give them a heads up, certified crowd manager, actually it just expired after we knew it. But um, we do take that into consideration. We do reach out to the town whenever we have larger events that where we think can't handle it. I mean, we only have so many bathrooms in the pavilion, so mm -hmm. it, you know, it limits us what we can have there. We don't want to overdo our septic system and, and everything else. So, I mean, as a business, we, we take precautions. I mean, I think we're, we're trying to contemplate everything that can possibly go wrong. And I worry about it. I mean, we can keep conjuring up all sorts of things. I think, you know, at some point we have to, again, assume people are acting in good faith. Um, again, want to protect the neighbors. It sounds like you guys are saying the right things in terms of wanting to have your own quiet enjoyment of your club and not be having to be brought in here all the time. So I think everybody's on the same page mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe to the crowd uh, size issue or something, we could just leave it that, you know, if, if on the off chance, there's some sort of a situation that we go on record right now saying that you will immediately be brought, brought back in here mm -hmm. um, should something occur that gets out of hand again i you know i don't know if it's 400 500 525 i mean i you know it just feels a little bit arbitrary but understand the point that you're all making and let's just hope it doesn't become an issue i mean in Is reality that, you could have a rowdy group of 50 people or a, a good group of, of 600 like right. there's really it's everything right now is hypothetical and i'd like to give you guys the opportunity to I don't want to say behave because it's not like, <laughs> like it's and, a, to be on your point okay. this past summer, we did get, I was actually bartending up front. We had a noise complaint for a 50th high school reunion that the music was too loud. Eight Police officers showed up, <laughs> sat in the front parking lot, could not hear the music. And I'm sure not judging anybody in here, but most people in there probably couldn't hear it either. But it's like, it, 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 we try to be good neighbors mm -hmm. and you know it, it again a 60 person party high school graduation party yeah kids could be screaming whatever i mean you'll have that i have a question for jennifer jennifer yes sorry jennifer um one thing i just wanted to check on is i remember at a previous um, meeting and, and separately, we had talked about as we were 
as discovery was occurring about this licensing um, for the two club licenses in town, both the Young Men's Club and the Legion, there's a written requirement that we get um, compensation history for board officers for like the past year or something like that. Um, and you said to wait until this happened to make sure that we got that so we can check off that box. We got it. We did get it. Yeah. It's in okay. here. Yep. All right, perfect. Yeah. I, the club turned it in, I date stamped it, and attached it with the documents for y'all to review. Okay, great. Yep. All right, I have one statement. Um, I asked the board to consider when they're talking about time for inside and outside. Mm -hmm that this is a residential neighborhood. It's zoned residential. Um, I hope that you would consider having a two-time slot so that anything outside of the clubhouse is 10 o'clock and anything inside is 1 o'clock, which is their present provision for operation. Just to stick with that and not add the deck because it's a fixture of the clubhouse for the one o'clock time zone. I'm asking you to exclude the deck from one o'clock. I, I just ask for you to consider that. Okay. All right, is there anyone else here that would like to speak on this? Uh, I made the assumption that the line is going to be moved back to the front of the building. Are you in agreement yep. on that? Yep. So that is going to be the new line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And so just so I'm clear, straight across north to south, no closer to the road right. as yep. extended. John, okay. John, you make it to your father. I want to ask about UMass runs their parties. That's zone agriculture residential. You guys put these same kind of restrictions on them because I never heard of one. They seem to do what they want, break all kinds of sound barriers, everything else, and nobody says nothing. Why? Tell us who you are, sir, please. What? Tell us who you are. Tell me who you are. Who your name is? <clears throat> I'm John Mitskowski. Who are you? I can't read that. Randy Iser. Good for you. I get a phone to pay for you what you did. Right. I think that very un un unbecoming. Not to place Johnny. John. Yes, it is. John. No, it's not. Because you did it. You know what the hell you said. Okay. Talk to me after. I'll talk to you with the public. Well, so are we ready to move yeah. on here or are there more comments? Please. Okay, is there any additional comments in regards to the Young Men's Club uh, alteration of premise? Okay. Let me just note one thing. The existing license does include the building and the pavilion uh, Monday to Saturday, 8 a.m. to 1 a.m., Sundays, 11 a.m. to 1 a.m. And so that includes the pavilion as it stands right now, right. 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. So do we want to have any further conversation about the the outside, the deck, the one o'clock? Do we want to see how it goes and then same rules apply? There's a problem. You're yanked right back right. in here and we may need to. And they, I mean, they're here. They hear you. It's been clear. very clear hey, about hey, what. Hey, I was just... all up earlier on Sundays for playing very well. Like, hey, well. <laughs> He's there. <laughs> I'm, I'm in favor of giving them a chance yeah. to mm -hmm. see how they can manage the deck. Oh, I agree. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll make a motion then that we approve the uh, section 12. <laughs> Be very clear. Section 12 license for the Young Men's Club as presented with the modification for the setback of the blue front, line. Front, front line. Setback. Front line. Um, to make sure alcohol isn't um, served or imbibed uh, beyond that point to encroach on the 
road, again, with the clear understanding that um, we're, this is on a trial basis. Um, and if any of the issues that the neighbors have brought up um, do arise, that we'd like to see you again. All second. Motion by Molly, seconded by Jane. Is there any further discussion from the select board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Great. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Happy holidays. <laughs> Amy. Yes. They're all closing hearings. Oh, and I'm going to close the public hearing. And we're going to move on. I'm not bullshit. You're going to have you out. Right. Okay. So. Same shoes you want to put out. Yeah. Okay. So moving moving on to old business. Actually, do you want me to do the park and rack? Okay. So we're gonna move on to old business. Excuse me, gentlemen. We're gonna continue our meeting. So if you guys are gonna continue to talk, you can do that outside. Or you can sit and listen to the meeting, up to you. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to invite uh, Jim, Jim Shea. Sorry, I was pulling it up. And then uh, is Amy Jennings here? She was unavailable. Okay. Um, so if you want to come up here. Um, can you handle the pressure, Jim? <laughs> These lights are pretty bright. <laughs> Um, so they're seeking approval for a change of location for the softball fields project. Uh, the, new, the new location of the fields will be behind the Hadley Elementary School. And so historically, this was a vote that we took in 2021, um, back when uh, David and uh, John were still on the board, um, and myself and, and Jane and Joyce. Um, originally, they had come to us wanting to do it uh, next to the Hadley, the new North Hadley Fire Station, and now they're they're looking to amend that. That's correct uh, for a couple of reasons. Initially, it was because that was one of the potential sites for the new DPW, and then there was also talk about possible soil contamination and um, issues like that. So we kind of put our heads together and um, came up with a new location, which actually makes a lot more sense because now we don't have to build a parking lot, which would have been two thirds of our budget for the field. Um, and if you have multiple children playing sports, you don't have to have one here and one up, you know, three, four miles up the road. So um, I neglected to come back to you folks after I got approval from everyone else I have spoken to uh, Principal Dowd, I spoke to the superintendent, and I spoke to the school committee, and all of them are on board with moving it, um, or the construction of a new field and the rehab of the old field that are there. Um, so I don't have any visual aids for you, but if you're standing behind the elementary school looking at uh, the safety complex, it would be field number three, which is to the left. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be the rehab field that we're going to skin. And skin means taking all the grass off of the infield and replacing it with the appropriate uh, fill. The reason we're doing that there is because if we put it where there isn't a field in the southeast corner, the outfields of the large baseball field, which is field number one, which is the southwest side of the field, um, there would be the outfields would overlap. And for baseball, they put in a temporary fence, um, and that just wouldn't work. So we're going to – I've met, we've measured it all up. And um, if we put the softball field down where field three is, it alleviates that situation. And then we can put a new field for the little kids – which is also going to be skinned so it can be used for softball and baseball. Um, and all of that is cheaper than putting the softball field in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's my request from you guys. I got permission from everybody else, but you and that luckily Carolyn reminded me that I needed to come in front of you guys again because we were moving it. So the youth baseball um, 
so for the summer and everything for their tournaments and stuff. So again, these fields will be, um, you'll be able to modify them for. So we don't, won't need to modify anything. The, the, it'll be a permanent softball field just for the young ladies that are playing. Oh, and, and then that's two, the two fields for yep. the youth base. Okay. Yeah. There'll be two, still two fields. There's the smaller one and the larger one. And then there'll be, so right now field three is for the little kids. That's pretty much the only ones that use it. It's the okay. park and rec and coach pitch, stuff like that. And so with grass and with these kids learning, um, the grass, if you hit the ball, it can catch a lip and come up and hit you in the face. So what we talked about with the president of Cal Ripken and their board, he said, I'd like it if it were just skinned like everything else. Right. So that takes away one of those possibilities that happening with those small kids. So that's why we're going to do it that way. I think it's a grand idea. Yep. Okay. All right. So a motion to um, approve the proposal that's been agreed upon by everybody else already. Second. <laughs> motion by Molly, seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Excellent. Thank you all very much. Thanks Good luck, Jim. Thanks for waiting, Jim. All right. Um, is there anyone else here that is waiting? The DPW uh, schematic design committee appointment. Okay. Let's do that since we have two individuals here for that. Um, so there are three letters of interest for the two open seats on the DPW schematic design committee. So we have David, Phil, and then uh, Richard is also here. Uh, so Bermucci, Bermucci, okay, excellent. Um, would the two of you like to come in the front here just so that you can be on camera and um, answer any questions? So I just want to say one thing before you start to say, Mr. Nyhart is interested as well. He is uh, with Joyce <laughs> mm -hmm. at the Legion. Um, I know there are two open <laughs> seats. I spoke with Tim and he said, if the board so desired, he would be willing to serve as a non-voting member. So I don't know if we need that, but I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And can I just clarify that you had spoken at the last one. I just looked at this. Um, you, you are, this will most likely be your building committee. Maybe. Yes. Yes. And we'll be talking about that. I just wanted to yeah. remind you. Yeah. Um, are either of the two of you on any other boards or committees in Hadley? At the moment, no. no. I, I was on municipal building until it was disbanded, mm -hmm. and at this point, no. Okay. I was, I'm a member of the Call Force Fire Department, but I was also a member of the North Hadley Building Committee. So uh, the only reason I'm asking is because I know that Tim's already on the bylaw committee, so if we were looking right. for... Any like you know like fresh blood? Yeah. Um, you want to just briefly tell us <laughs> I hate why? To say that. <laughs> fresh fresh blood. Blood. Yeah. <laughs> Can we just hear quickly like why both of you were interested? Well, um, I was on a design committee at UMass for Booster Dining Commons. That was a fifty million dollar project. Ended up at. Um, I've been in ma building maintenance for forty five years at UMass. And uh, I did work for the highway department, uh, starting back with Mike Majeski, Mike Klamasi, and Joe Pip plowing part-time doing water meters and, and whatnot. So I kind of know the ins and outs of the trucks and how it worked at least a while back. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm probably the closest neighbor. <laughs> You're a neighbor. <laughs> I thought it was more of a backyard protection. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, without all of that, and, you know, now that municipal building wasn't isn't there any longer, I feel well, it's an open spot. Why not give it a shot? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I would absolutely believe that the DPW needs something, but I hear a lot of people squawking already from numbers that they've heard. And I'd like to come up with something that DPW is happy with and the taxpayer is happy with. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's right where these guys already came up with. Not, I haven't seen the plans and I'm not gonna criticize what's there, but I mm -hmm. think a new set of eyes can come up with a suggestion or two. Yep. So. Sounds good, okay. 
Um, yeah, so I've been in the building trades for 25 years. I own and operate Bermuda Construction um, here in Hadley. Probably see the trucks all over the place. Um, I'm familiar with, you know, commercial buildings, residential buildings. Um, the second that, I, I've heard the same thing. So kind of level-headed, like, you know, can kind of find that needs and wants um, balance uh, as a resident and a taxpayer. Um, so I just a uh, way to get back. I'm, you know, kind of had to step away from the fire department somewhat. I'm still involved as much as I can be, but my way to kind of give back to the town, I want to be involved. Um, I think I would be a, a good asset. Who else is on this committee already? Randy Iser, Jim Maximowski, Jerry Berg, Andy Klopacki, uh, Wally Sykowski. Who else? Tom Quillen. Scott. I was going to say, you have Scott like Scott. Gary. I got Gary. Who else, Jim? No. Um, Tom Quinlan, do you have him? Oh, yeah. No. And, and the building inspectors. That's it. That's the seven that's there now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Jim, uh, you're the chair. Is that right? Chair of the first committee. Yeah. We'll be reorganizing for this one. Okay. Do you have any objection to either of these two individuals? I, I was going to say, if Tim is willing to act as a non-voting member, you probably got your decision. I highly recommend both these guys, all three of them. Okay. Um, I guess I'd leave it to the committee to decide when they reform if they need a non-voting member. Um, I'm happy know. to appoint well, these two individuals yeah. Well, tonight. Yeah, I think... I mean, we can we can revisit it. I guess does that make sense, Jimmy? You, you want to have a meeting, and if we decide Tim will be helpful, then we'd have to come back to the board to get him appointed. Well, I mean, if if or you could just change your criteria and appoint all three members. I don't know if you can do that. I wouldn't do that. Yeah. You don't want an even number, right? Yeah, I I mean, I worry about the again just with these committees that sometimes it's only just one or two more bodies just tip the scales and then you never then the evenings turn into <laughs> so i'm trying to look out for you guys in part so but, are you concerned uh, these guys might be long-winded molly is no, that what no. you're saying? <laughs> but, but I, mean, I think the idea of adding the two was to make sure that we had a broader community perspective uh -huh. yeah um i don't want to make it so unwieldy and all right, well, let's... So I'm going to make a motion that we accept the applications and appoint um, Rick Bermucci and David Phil to the DPW Facilities Schematic Design Committee. I'll second say. that. Like I guess no, I'll let you second it because I got to say. <laughs> um, motioned by Molly, seconded by Jane. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Welcome to the committee. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just have one comment for the two for the two gentlemen that we typically meet at four o'clock in the afternoon on about the third Wednesday of the month. So just be aware of that that it is not a night meeting. We can make it work. Yeah, I'm really tired, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so Amy, if I can just remind you guys to get sworn in at the clerk's office, but also I think on the, the next select board meeting to clarify the name as well as the purpose of it and the beginning and end. I know that's been an issue in the past of when the committees. Meeting. Yeah. So we'll clarify that purpose. Yeah. Or maybe we'll put that purpose in the chair's hands and have them write a purpose and, right. and, and, we'll and we'll approve it. Better. All right. Okay. Thank you. Right, Thank you. Guys. Okay. Um, do you, uh, form of town government? Do we have? We got license renewals. We didn't do those yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we actually we... have um, oh. Patricia Lloyd up there from the Collins Center. Is that right? So you have the Collins Center here. Um, it's a. Uh, I'll, I can actually, I can have, if Troy is on, if he wants to introduce them, I'm see Anthony, I see, yeah. You have, you have the whole team here. So I'll let Anthony introduce everybody. Troy, sure, thank you. Let me, I'll, what I'll do is I'll, let me pull up the slides first. And then I'll have everyone introduce themselves. Um, do we want to have the slides up there? 
he's going to put them up. Okay. If, if I can just preface this for one second, the, uh, the reason we've invited the Collins Center here is as a, this is a part of the discussion that was, that was, has begun about a strong town administrator and a special act. And as we, I, I, I ran into Anthony why at, when the Lieutenant Governor was here and they explained that they do present to towns different forms of government, what it means. It's more educational right now, There's, um, but also um, they'll be able to present to you what they can do to help if that's of any interest to you. But I think presentation itself is going to be very, very... I told them 15 minutes, so we're going to try. <laughs> okay, thank you. We're going we're gonna to try to keep this to 15 minutes and I'll just, um, let me just activate the share. Can you all see... Uh, See the presentation. Yep. Yes. Um, so the town the town administrator did a, a sort of a great introduction. It's kind of a broad. It's really is a broad overview of organizational structure at the municipal level. Um, my name is Anthony Wilson. I'm a public service manager at the uh, Collins Center. I'll give a little background on the Collins Center in a second, um, but I'll have the rest of my team introduce themselves. Start with Pat Patricia. Hi, I'm Pat Lloyd. I'm also with the Collins Center, and I practice at the Collins in the areas of charters and organizational work. Um, and I also work in the HR, on the HR team with the Collins Center. Mel? Yes, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, my name is Mel Kleckner with the Collins Center as well, also working in organizational structure. Um, and I uh, have the distinction of serving as a town administrator for uh, about 41 years in Massachusetts. So uh, I am retired recently uh, and I provide a more practical review when we um, review uh, charters and other organizational structures and communities. So I'm gonna quickly just go through the background um, of the presentation. So we have a quick background on the Collins Center, some basics on uh, the charter. The charter is essentially um, what we call a foundational document for municipal uh, governments. Um, Hadley does not have one. Um, and we'll sort of we can explain that and, and explain the process uh, as it relates to charter and why Hadley doesn't uh, doesn't have one. Um, the process for charter adoption, the different forms of government, general trends that municipalities across the state are, are have been moving to or the direction that things have been going, alternatives to charter. Um, as well as some guiding principles as any community looks towards modernizing its uh, its organization. And then we'll finish it up with some quick questions. Um, so, so we're not seeing, I'm sorry to, to pause. We're not seeing the slideshow. We're still seeing the- um, Just the first page. The, the first page as if it's in edit mode. Yep. Oh, let me see. Oh, there you there go. go. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah, quick background on the Collins Center. Formed in uh, 2008 by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, placed inside of the University of Massachusetts with the express, express goal of providing management consulting advice to public entities like um, municipalities, but also state agencies and really any public organization. Uh, we've worked with more than uh, two thirds of the 351 municipalities across the state. And we're here today to talk specifically about charter and organizational structure, but we worked in areas finance, human resources, uh, analytics, IT, uh, and uh, executive recruitments. Uh, we've worked in towns as small as uh, less than 1,000 residents and towns as big as um, you know more than 100,000 uh, residents. We're going to talk more about the forms of government um, that are pr uh, predominant across the state, and the center has worked in all of them. Uh, we've helped with uh, transitions from one form of government to another, as well as uh, improvements to existing governmental structures. And uh, at the bottom there, there's some, some of the uh, projects that we have currently underway. We're in Somerville right now, um, Cambridge, Ludlow, Rockland, Sanders Field, a, a very small community in Williamstown. And these are some of our most recent uh, charter and organizational structures uh, that we've completed. Um, you'll see the most recent one is Plymouth, Watertown, um, a, a neighbor of yours, Amherst, Framingham, Pittsfield, Northampton, Everett, uh, Newburyport, all going back to 2005, and Melrose. And I'm going to turn it over to Mel to talk about some charter basics. Mel. 
Mel, we can't. Mel, I can't hear you. I think you're muted, Mel. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, what we'd like to uh, talk about now is really what a charter is. And as uh, Anthony mentioned, it is a uh, foundational document that comprehensively addresses the fundamental structure and operation of a town government, similar um, like a constitution uh, to a state and federal government. Now, there are some towns that have town manager or town administrator special acts. Um, they are sort of like mini charters, but they're not full charters. And we're gonna talk about that option uh, with you later on. Um, and many towns do not have a single document uh, that serves as a charter at all. Its structure and operation is a cumulative result of state laws, special state laws and local bylaws. And that is the case with Hadley. Um, and just to um, uh, clarify that charters uh, are always subordinate to state law, but they are, um, they are uh, uh, superior to local bylaws. So um, I won't read this, but um, you, you'll have the presentation uh, with you. And um, I think this is a really good summary of what a charter is. Uh, it's quoted from uh, the National Civic League and I will let you read it at your leisure. Next. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Hadley's local government uh, in your case is over 300 plus years old. And uh, over that time period, there's been state laws that relate to um, organization of local government. You've accepted a number of state laws. You've adopted special home rule legislation. I noted the uh, public works uh, legislation a few years ago. And of course, have local bylaws as all municipalities do. What the charter does, it creates a single record of all of how the town operates. And uh, it clarifies in all of these 300 year um, uh, accumulation of, of, of things that your government is based on. And also when you adopt the charter, uh, most towns will look at um, to see if uh, the government is responsive to Hadley and its unique culture and community. Uh, next slide. And uh, in that way, what you're doing is not only codifying existing town government structure with modern terms and concepts, but you're also considering different forms of government uh, you know, you're asking yourself, is the existing town government structure responsive to how municipal government has evolved um, over years and in the 21st century? Next. So, um, you know, you're, you're ensuring that your town structure is consistent with state and federal law as well. There's um, laws uh, that particularly impact municipalities, labor and employment laws. Those are both state and federal. You have your procurement and open meeting law, which are states, state laws. And um, many communities also ensure that the charter is consistent with um, evolving values and cultural changes. For example, uh, gender pronouns and also the names of boards. I believe Hadley has already adopted the select board name, but those often happen in these charters. Next slide. So I'm going to uh, now turn it over to Pat Lloyd who will um, handle the next set of slides. Pat, you're muted. Pat, Pat, you're muted. Thank you. Um, in Massachusetts, there are two paths to adopting a charter. Um, one path is through a citizen petition in which an elected charter commission is established um, and very precise timetables and, um, and detailed state laws are followed. This completely circumvents the legislature. Um, a charter is recommended by the commission to be approved by the attorney general and then goes directly to voters. Um, that is not what we're here to talk about tonight. Um, a special act charter is another way of making changes or, for, or creating a charter, or we will talk about some other special act pathways. Um, typically, the, the process is initiated by the select board. The select board would appoint a charter committee, and this committee um, will gather information, make recommendations to the select board. Um, we'll talk about the process in a little more detail in the next slide.
Once a charter commit review committee is convened by the by the select board, the committee goes through a work plan, which is a very thorough process of getting input from all the stakeholders in town, including including the staff, including departments, including the public, and they will we get together and prepare a final report and recommendation, which is submitted to the select board. Now, the select board can take these recommendations, can choose to accept them, you know, as a whole, and or can instead choose some of the selections, some of the recommendations to put forward to town meeting. When, if the board approves any of these recommendations, they're put on the warrant at town meeting to ask to ask the town whether they would approve a special act petition for town meeting action. Um, if it's approved by this town meeting, then this proposed charter, it goes to the legislature. Um, this is different than the original process we, we talked about. Um, the, the legislature then go, will... Oh, excuse me? Was there a question? Oh, I guess I didn't hear. Um, the legislature then takes the petition um, has it reviewed very thoroughly by um, its own state process. Um, if it finds it acceptable, it assigns it to a committee, it holds a hearing, um, and usually your state legislature will help shepherd this through the process. Um, if once the committee, if the committee reports favorably on it, the bill has to be approved by both houses of the legislature and signed by the governor. Um, there's a final step if the legislature approves the charter, the voters then will um, determine ultimately whether the proposed charter will go forward. What we do at the Collins Center is really shepherd the committee through the process of creating a charter and deciding whether to make any recommendations. Um, the first step is really looking at what is the structure on the ground currently in the town. Um, we, we thoroughly help the committee research the current structure and what is the what is going on in the town right now. Um, what are the questions that the committee has? What are the changes that the town might be considering for the future? Uh, we The committee will then create a public process to get more input from residents, businesses, stakeholders, departments um, and really hear what are the what are the most pressing issues facing the town. Um, we look at other forms of government um, and I believe we'll talk a little bit about the forms of government um, given Hadley's size. Uh, there may be some limitations in the overall forms of governments but there's a lot to do. There, there are a lot of suggestions that we could possibly make in the current form of government. Um, the committee will prepare a report document the, documenting the findings and then make their recommendations um, to the select board and ultimately if the select board chooses to go forward to town meeting. Uh, this whole process, the committee process, generally takes about 12 to 18 months. And I think Anthony will be talking about the forms of government. So I'll briefly go through the forms of government. And um, sort of at the outset, I just want to state that um, municipalities can take, um, I don't say they can take many forms, but there are often pieces of some forms that may bleed into others. So these are general categories. And even within forms, there can be some, some um, variety. Um, but generally, in Massachusetts, um, communities really fall into one of three forms, and, and they are in two categories, towns, uh, which generally um, have a uh, select board and have some form of town meeting. The two most common are the open town meeting, um, which I believe is Hadley's, and then there's a representative town meeting. In the city form, there's a mayor council um, a form, which itself has some variety. But when we talk about mayor council, we're generally talking about what is sort of colloquially called um, the strong mayor um, and a um, city council. And then there is the city manager form of government where the city manager um, that runs the day-to-day -day operations, um, but is hired and sort of managed by the city council. Um, 
There are some limitations based on the Massachusetts um, Constitution. Communities with less than 6,000 um, uh, inhabitants um, cannot uh, form a representative town meeting, and communities with less than 12,000 uh, residents uh, cannot form any, any of the types of city government. And this is, uh, I won't belabor this slide, it's a, a general outline of sort of two things. The raw number of municipalities that fall into one or the other category, as you can see, just in terms of municipalities, the vast majority on the left hand side of the screen are open town meetings, uh, open town meeting communities. Um, but population wise, um, there's a significant tilt towards um, uh, city uh, mayor, uh, city mayor council form of government. Um, so the vast numerically, open town meeting is the predominant form of government in Massachusetts, but most people will find themselves just by population in a um, in a mayor council form of government. So form of government, open uh, the summary of Hadley's uh, form of government, Hadley as an open town meeting, um, as uh, Mel stated earlier, uh, it's an a, a, it's an aggregation of municipal gen general laws, uh, optional laws, special legislative acts, and bylaws that have been sort of formed over time. They're not located in a specific place. So one of the, um, I guess one of the issues that can arise is that it, when a person is researching um, the structure of government in a community like Hadley, they may find some out of date reference. Um, about how what the, how the structure is supposed to be fo be focused, and it you do have to do that research to know oh something has been amended changed um, to understand how um, how things currently operate, or know that amendments have been made. Uh, the executive of the um, town of Hadley, um, that's who we're talking to, the five member select board, um, which has um, again colloquially called sort of the weak town administrator role. Um, we've counted eleven elected officials, including boards. Um, and you follow a, a budget process common to uh, open town meetings. The town administrator prepares the budget, submits it to the select board for the policy direction, and it goes to the finance committee, which has the uh, responsibility of reviewing and recommending a budget to the town to the town meeting. This chart was taken from a, a DLS report that was provided to the town, I believe, back in 2017. Um, I think the big thing to take from this chart is that it uh, Hadley has a uh, relatively flat organizational structure. Um, all, pretty much all, um, or sorry, most, the majority of town employees report directly to the select board. Um, and while under the bylaws, the town administrator has um, sort of uh, supervisory authority within the town, they really don't have any... Um, authority relative to hiring, firing, um, promotions or anything or anything of that nature. Um, so there, there aren't really any direct reports to the town administrator. Uh, and so some of these came up in the Department of Revenue 2017 report. Uh, they recommended and we're not necessarily recommending these things. These are just we're just pointing out sort of things that um, the town has already information is already received from from sort of another source, which was to grant uh, grant the town administrator sort of greater appointing authority, uh, combine and appoint the elected treasurer uh, collector positions, which is actually when we get to the trends, that's one of the trends uh, across the state as uh, to have that in a consolidated office um, to create a full time human resources and, inf and information technology function um, and to create a staff based financial management team. That last one is also um, a trend across the state of uh, municipal finance is increasingly becoming complex. Um, and so to have a dedicated team working in the same direction on that has just been a trend across the state. And I, I, I still stole some of his thunder, but I'll turn it over to Mel to talk about the trends. Thank you, Anthony. Um, yeah, when, when a community um, engages in a charter, um, there are a number of things they're looking at but usually um, it involves looking at the organization uh, and uh, creating a more streamlined organization. As Anthony said, that uh, chart, the organization chart is very flat. 
what you're typically seeing uh, in charters these days are a reduction in the number of elected boards and officials combined with the centralization of management under one appointed manager or administrator. Um, that's not always the case and that's not required, but that's what we, we see most often when we're working in communities. There's an emphasis on the budget process, including long-term capital planning, uh, highlighting some of the powers that towns have as home rule provides. Uh, emerging technology sometimes comes into it, especially around community engagement processes. Uh, standardized procedures for the conduct and operation of local government, remove gender references, and also uh, a requirement that you have a periodic review of both your charter and your bylaws. Also, what we're seeing is, um, in many cases, removal of residency requirements um, for employees, including the uh, administrator, uh, mechanisms for assuring that the charter is enforced, uh, defining coordinating emergency management activities, uh, how, can, how, how residents can participate and stay informed, that's referred generally as community engagement, and the adoption of procedures for resident initiatives, referenda, and recall of elected officials. So these are the kind of things that we tend to see more often these days than not. Um, uh, as Pat Lloyd mentioned, we as the at the Collins Center can help facilitate a committee or if the select board is doing it, uh, th their analysis of these trends, including best practices and providing sample language. So if you are not going to pursue a charter, there are some, some um, alternative or parallel paths that can be taken either at the same time that a charter review is going on or in place of, the, of a comprehensive charter. And one of those is, I know you've talked previously about a town manager or a town administrator act. Um, now uh, that is a special act uh, of the legislature. So it has the same authority as a charter but it's only addressing a limited aspect of your town government, but um, it's possible that um, that's the issue and, and, and you wanna work on that either in advance or uh, parallel to the uh, discussion that the, that the charter committee is having. Um, and that, that goes also with the conversion of certain elected officials uh, uh, from elected to appointed. Um, always wanna uh, review outdated processes and establish best practices. Um, one of the things we'd, we'd like to encourage that if a charter process has been initiated, these, pro these parallel paths or alternative paths are coordinated that um, you, if you have appointed a committee and they're starting to work and do research on your town and all alternative forms, they really need to be part of the process as you make other changes or consider other changes. And um, I'll go quickly through this. Uh, we do a lot of charter work and what we focus on are the following, uh, clarity, consistency, coordination, and accountability. And uh, that's the, uh, the end of our presentation, and we're very happy to uh, listen to your questions. Um, you know, there are, there are other major issues facing you, um, and, you know, you probably want to deal with those in your charter. So if you're having budgetary issues, and you want to strengthen your financial management or you have land use issues and you need to you know, deal with the planning process, those are all things that you want to look at during a process. But not all issues can be examined and resolved uh, during these processes. And often what will happen is the committees might say, uh, we're going to prioritize this and, and you know, look at something else down the road. So that's also another, another way to, uh, to make this a little bit more manageable. And uh, that um, is the end of our presentation, and we're very happy to uh, take any questions or comments that you have. Thank you. So if we wanted to engage with the Collins Center on an in initiative like this, um, can you talk a little bit about how municipalities have been able to fund it? I mean, are they typically doing a warrant article and getting the money at town meeting? Or are they grants available? What are you seeing? Well, Often um, it is it is sort of out of your sort of general fund, so it would be through through that warrant process. There are um, for specific items. Uh, there's the state does offer off, offer the uh, best practices grant. Now that's closed for this year. They usually do them every year. Um, so you know if you were looking into doing it next year, you'd, you'd have to really think about 
the parameters for that type of grant request um, in sort of what what type of projects it would cover. Um, but the, the the I would say the more than not, it's the um, sort of the general fund uh, warrant request. And can you just like a general price range? You know, twenty five, fifty, seventy five, one hundred. Um, I would say I would say not not. I haven't seen any for fifty or, or seventy five. So so you're looking for <laughs> below that. <laughs> um, um, it but it but you know it really does vary uh, based on it, what happens usually when we're scoping a project like this. We're spending time talking to usually it's it's through the um, uh, town town manager town administrator. What is the you know what is the select board talked about? What is the interest? What's the scope of uh, what you're trying to do? Uh, Mel talked about the difference between this sort of full charter review and the sort of focused town manager town administrator act um, in the process around that. And so and so I would say it, it, it could vary you know twenty thirty fifteen ten um, somewhere in there. But again, it's it's very community specific. It's very project specific um, and things of that nature. So uh, the select board would appoint a committee and you would guide them or you would be doing the work. Um, so there's, there's a, there's a number of, there's no, there's no right or wrong way. Well, I mean, legally there could be a wrong way, but there's no sort of right or wrong way to, to form the committee. I think this community, I know that there was in the past a special act submitted by um, um, I think the HR director, uh, to the select board. So it could be an entirely select board driven process. Um, the select board could appoint a committee with select board members. Um, and then we would work with whether it's the select board or whether it's a committee with a combination of citizens or just citizens, um, we would work with them because there's often a lot of questions about what do other communities, uh, do? Are we, um, what are the best practices? Um, um, what are the, um, sort of the the laws or the parameters around this or that. So we, we help to answer those questions. Um, we help to structure a process um, that can sort of get to the goals that uh, people are looking for. And we do help with the actual drafting um, to make sure that the language fits. There's a, there's a push towards um, readable sort of natural language, not to sort of be overly formalistic, to make it so that just about anyone in town could read and understand what's written. Um, so we help with with those sorts of things. So it's it's primarily focused on drafting. Uh, we're helping people form a process within the committees to get to the answers that they want. Um, and there's the drafting piece. Those are the sort of the three areas where we provide sort of the most assistance. So we could essentially do like an act if we were interested in doing a strong town administrator, and that's completely separate from a charter. It can be like within a charter if we should if we chose to do a charter at a later date or something like that. How does that work? Pat or Mel, feel free to to, to um uh, jump in here. But I think the distinction here is that it's still if it's the the what we call the town manager or town administrator act, it's still a, an organizational change to the to the town, but it's scoped much smaller versus when we think about it a, a, a charter thinking holistically about how the entire town operates versus just how the town administrator uh, interacts mm -hmm. with the rest of the town. Pat or, or Mel, feel free to fill in where I left a gap. No, so, we, we've, wor we've worked with uh, communities that have uh, created town administrator act, and then we build a charter around that, or or we do it right from the ground up and uh, do it all all at once. Um, so there's there's a lot of different you know ways to do that. So if if we were thinking about pursuing this um, and we wanted to get the funding for it, obviously we'd need to go through that scoping effort with you to find out what we might be looking at. So what would that process look like? So um, it's usually um, uh, the times that I've done, it's usually been uh, with the sort of town administrator, town manager. Um, and they've been sort of the go-between, I think, with the committee. Um, but it would be, it would be focused on the priorities of the committee. Um, and I'll just, I'll be candid. I think most of the times were that most that all of us who have been in the call participated, it was 
the select board having a discussion on what they think sort of needs to be fixed in either um, getting us on board to help them or they're appointing a committee sort of with those goals as their guideposts. And then we're assigned to work with that committee. Mm -hmm. Right. So, have any other questions? Yeah, right right now. now, that's great. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for your presentation. Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. Okay. Um. So, is that something that we can put on a future agenda to talk about? Mm -hmm. Yep, I would agree with that. Um, all right, so let's jump back into old business. Um, Jennifer is on still, and we are looking to do the 2024 license renewals. Um, and I think we need to do these tab by tab. Yes. I think that's how we did it last time. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Jennifer, is so, so are you okay to just go ahead and take the votes? So we'll start with alcohol. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I make a motion to approve the alcohol licenses as presented. Second. Motion by Molly. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, motion to approve the common VIC licenses as presented. Second. Motion by Molly. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to approve the class one and Class two licenses is presented. Second. Motion by Molly. Second by favor. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Motion to approve the entertainment licenses is presented. Second. Motion by Molly. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to approve the automatic amusement licenses as presented. Second. Motion by Molly. Seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. All right. Um, um, can I ask, can I ask really quickly? Um, I was I was out this this morning, so I checking the mail. I added two more in this evening. Um, it's Cinemark's theater license and um, Premier Amusements, which is the Cinemark's arm that does the automatic amusements for 13 automatic amusement licenses. Can I ask y'all to approve those as well, please? Motion to approve Cinemark and the Premier, is that what you called it? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Sure. Motion by Molly, seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, so, oh, um, Town Administrator Foles update. Um, that's in here. I think it was more for informational. I don't think yeah, we need that. her. I don't think we need her to go through and read all of that. No, and Carolyn, if you want to, um, if we have any questions or anything, just bring them to you directly. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Uh, cannabis equity policy. That one should be pretty quick, I believe. Yeah, we looked at this and got a clarification from our last meeting. Yep. So, right. Um, so is there any questions or discussion on this? Well, I think for the, the, uh, um, viewing audience should know what the clarification was since the question was posed in, at our meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. So that Randy, that was your question. And it had to do if we would be forced basically to not grant the second license. If in fact, we didn't have an applicant that met the criteria. Mm -hmm. Correct. And, the and that indeed is the case. That indeed is the case. So my question, knowing that is, how much money do we take in currently from the two licenses is that we have out there now? Do we know the answer to that? Jennifer, do you have those exact numbers? I mean, just give me a ballpark. I don't need exact. Well. I can't tell you the tax revenue, but I know that we took in 85,000 from the HCA agreement from only one of ours, um, but we have not received any funds from the other. Yeah, and the it's, up a, 
it's up That's over a hundred. So are if we are we obligated to have this policy in place? Yes. Yeah. That's why it's in front of you. Okay. Forget any more questions. Yeah, there's essentially <laughs> nothing we can do. Equity policy. Second. All right. Motion by Jean, seconded by Molly. All those in favor? Aye. All right. <laughs> I mean, is that like <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we're essentially trumped by the state um, in that one. We have a collective thing here. All right. So we have the, um, we're here to vote on the collective bargaining agreement for the United States or the United Public Services Employment Union, uh, local two, uh, 424, um, unit MADIV 127, Hadley Public Work Employees, DPW Supervisors, um, effective July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2026. And this was something that we had already voted on. Motion to approve. Okay, so hang on just one second. What I'm looking at doesn't have the right date on it. The first page of whatever document I have says so July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2023. So I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right either. Oh, it should be 2020. Could be wrong. Okay. It is getting late. <laughs> yeah. We switched those out, Randy. I'll load the correct one right up back in right now. Okay, that's fine. As long as I know it's being corrected, I'm yeah. good. Motion to approve subject to the administrative correction. Second. All right, motion by Molly, seconded by Randy. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Um for the administrative correction. That was for the administrative correction. Now you have to vote on it. Wait, no, we, oh, she, no, she, no, that I was a, she was, it was contingent, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, she wasn't amending <laughs> the motion. All right, excellent, so I think we're, we've done everything in new business, um, are there any other items not anticipated 48 hours in advance? Just do ever, oh, and just, I guess, make sure that I, let me change it, to my resignation, job and depth did all that. Okay, any other items not anticipated 48 hours in advance? Excellent. Uh, town administrator's report. Jennifer, did, did you get that on? No. Let's see. I'm sorry, I might have missed it. Hold on. I'm sorry. That's okay, you're not feeling great. Do you wanna just... Um, I can, yeah, let me just highlight it. They'll, if, if, if you can put it up there, I'll just highlight the changes real quick. Uh, let's see, hold on. I just got to find it. Here you go. Can you see it? Yes. Finger, that's good. Yeah, I'm having trouble pulling mine up, of course. So it looks like DPW feasibility is in red. <laughs> yes, anything in red is an update. So I did, I there was some uh, some updates that I did want to give on the dike, but um, those are DPW. Uh, oh. We've got one position there that is in the screening process, the HR assistant, the firefighter, and Hadley Media uh, Production Assistant. Uh, that's an interview we've interviewed, and I think there's probably some job offers that may, um, not job offers, but offering and then coming to you guys for approval. Um, great. Um, I'm having trouble seeing it. So so yeah, I'm sorry. I can't see it from that far, so I got to try to pull it up. Here. No, I got my glasses on. Oh, there you go. If you just do like one one page and just zoom it in, maybe. Yeah. What I what I wanted to explain with the municipal solar is I've actually changed that from municipal to the COA solar. Um, I've had I'm continuing my conversations with Jonathan Parrott, and I did bring in some, uh, conversations with um, can, Jennifer. Can you slide that down, please? 
There you go. So um, I met with uh, Jonathan and Nick Darbelhoff. I th- I'm probably killing that name, but um, from Sunbug, which is owned by Revision right now. Um, I had met with representative with uh, representatives from the Climate Change Committee to just talk about moving forward with solar and what was the best for Hadley. And they did meet with Jonathan and I, uh, Jonathan felt it was important to talk with a company out there who was interested in bigger projects like this. Cause what, if you remember Eversource was a, um, really was interested in the landfill, but they are no longer interested in that. But we, I wanted to bring in someone who's familiar with that, with those options. And I will be bringing up at a future uh, committee, um, select board meeting about meeting with the climate change committee, the finance committee and the select board to look at um, what, if there's a, a larger option, which would include the landfill and the two roofs, the library and the COA. So that's coming up, but that has, uh, I spent a lot of time on that the last week. So um, I'm excited that there could be some options. So if we go down the levy, uh, Rich Niles from uh, Woodard and Sampson, he is going to be uh, submitting a mul- uh, municipal vulnerabil- vulnerabil- vulnerability grant to advance the project to a 30% design. Uh, we can, we actually, I think we have three uh, MVP grants going with letters of interest um, and they take a look at it and see what we're submitting. You can do multiple ones so that they're not competing with each other, but this will just enhance this uh, the design to a 30% design um, and just keep us going. So uh, that's where that is right now. I'll keep you updated on that. So are you saying that we could get grant money to pay for this? No, for the this study. is for the design. For, I mean, for the, yeah, the for design. The design. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, this, this, even the design is multi-year. You're, it's different phases. This is just bringing it one step closer. Uh, reminding you about the conference. I, I think we've regist- registered a couple of you to go. So um, keep going, Jen. I think that's it. Okay. That's the only update I have. Yes. Right. Okay. Yep. okay. Um, are there any uh, items for future discussion that anyone would like to have on future agenda? Okay. Any liaison reports? <clears throat> um, any announcements? Okay. All right, then um, I move pursuant to MGL Chapter 30A, Sections 21A3, that the board go into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to Wilson Properties Group versus Hadley, ATB case number X-31254, case of Elaine Manor LP versus Hadley, ATB case number F-349233, case HAP Community Services versus Hadley, Housing Court Civil Action number 19H79CV000509, in the case of Town versus Ronald Nestor, Housing Court Civil Action Number 22H79CV000946, the case of Britain versus Bombardier et al. Court slash agency land court docket numbers 21MISC000452 DRR, the case of Valley Community Development Corporation versus the Town of Hadley Zoning Board of Appeals Court Agency Housing Appeals Committee. As the chair, I have determined that the public discussion of which will have a detrimental impact on the litigating position of the board. Second. Uh, roll call to go into executive session. Roll call vote, Keegan. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Kevin Smith. Yes. And Iser. Yes. The board will con- will reconvene in open session to finish the legal update.
general matter point of view, let me, I want to give you an overview just to remind the, the board. So um, when we were originally engaged, um, we were engaged on an hourly rate. And then it became, I think, clear that it was beneficial to the town um, and actually to help try to reduce litigation that we, we moved to a flat fee. And so all of these general matters that I'm going to talk to you about covered under our flat fee. The only thing that is not covered under the flat fee are labor and in litigation. So all general matters, you know, if Jennifer has a quick question on licensing during the week and picks up the phone and calls us and asks us a licensing question, or Carolyn picks up the phone and calls us and asks us a procurement question, those are all covered under the flat fee. Um, so that's just as a reminder, that's how we do our work. So um, the big matters that I'm working on right now um, are the resolution of the contract track dispute related to the Hockman Cemetery. Um, the next steps on that is I have to reach out to the, um, to the attorney for the um, contractor. Um, I've received all of the information I need to receive from the DPW um, relative to that construction compliance with the contract, and hopefully we'll be able to um, resolve that issue and finish up that project. Um, I've also been monitoring after our original negotiation of the administrative consent order related to the um, work at Algonquin and Wampanoag. Um, I'm engaged on reviewing um, all the conversations between DEP and the engineers um, to make sure that the administrative consent order is complied with and responding to any questions that Carolyn has. The engineers and the DEP director are doing a great job, by the way, of working on that. Um, we recently drafted the historic preservation restriction um, that was voted as part of the CPA funds at town meeting um, for St. John's Church. Um, that pres preservation restriction, unlike a couple of years past, is actually approved by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so it was perpetual. So that's the restriction that we uh, provided to the town that will be part of the CPA grant award. Uh, we also facilitated... Um, as I think you know, the road taking for Birch Meadow, um, and we did all the work um, related to that, the votes for town meeting, the titles related to the documents, the review of the plans, and then obviously the uh, the takings process, and then the recording of the appropriate documents. Um, then uh, just as an overview for the labor um, work from Kate uh, in my office, uh, she's done the negotiations with the Municipal Employees Union, the police officers. Uh, she's handled a police officer um, disciplinary matter and a firefighter disciplinary matter. They've completed the supervisor's negotiation, the flex work hours policy, and the remote work policy. Um, also, my colleague Liz is the one who gave you the cannabis equity policy, um, and you're right. Uh, the Commonwealth is requiring that you have until June of next year to adopt it. Um, and uh, Randy, if the uh, license becomes available, you have to keep it open at least six months um, if you don't have an applicant, and then you can move on. Um, so that's that's the social equity policy related to cannabis. Um, I did want to throw in a couple of things here. Um, I heard Carolyn talking about the, the solar options, and this is one of the reasons our flat fee actually is, is helpful. Okay. Um, we did not open the doors up for the flat fee. One second. Waiting room's off. Do, uh, so I'm going to do all things. No one's in it. Okay. Can I continue? Are we good? Yeah. Okay. So the last thing I just wanted to point out, Carolyn, you were talking in your update about the solar options for the landfill and the two roofs. Um, when you're considering that, um, you should keep in mind there are three ways to engage companies in doing those facilities. Now. Um, there is a program called the Power Options Program. I'm not a fan, but it's helpful. Um, you don't have to go out to bid for it. Um, they um, have their own vendor called Select. Um, I 
you know, I'm not a fan of their contracts, but that's a negotiation item. So you could you could get some information from them through the folks that you're already talking to. If you don't want to go out to bid, you can use the 64A exemption, um, which shows how you found your contractors to go into those both of those solar options, um, but for the lease and the PPA. And then, of course, you can do it through 30B as well. Where you have the landfill as well as the two roofs, um, that may be attractive to some of the um, larger carriers like Blue Wave. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's beneficial to take a look at all of that. Um, are you in the Wamiko? Um, are you in the Wamiko area, or what other what utility do you guys have? Folks, they're not interested. They're okay. Interested. Yeah, it's we okay. are. So this, what's happened is um, the climate change has gotten, uh, committee has been very interested in this. And so um, I have want to make sure that it gets focused and researched, but it's under the select board's authority to pursue this and want to engage other committees. So I think that you're going to be a big part of this. This is a complicated thing. So thank you. Yeah. And I, and I would just say to you, there's a, um, uh, Beth Greenblatt in management, I think it's called. Um, she does the financial and the solar tax equity part of this um, uh, and solar tax credit part of this. And so anybody that gives you proposals and frankly, I would say to you, um, you know, we have to do the legal end, but the most important part of this that you need to have reviewed by somebody who's familiar with the industry is the financial end, because you will get proposals that do not give the town as much as you can get out of this. Yeah. And somebody like Beth, somebody like Beth Greenblatt would be really sure. beneficial. But in any event, um, Management Beacon, um, I'll send you the information. Yeah. Okay. The big areas that I've been working on, in addition to our day-to-day -day stuff, licensing questions, you know, open meeting law, public records law, procurement stuff that happens on a weekly basis. Thank you for being there. Um, so um, I'm going to ask, I am sorry, but I think people may not have gotten on because I'm not seeing Someone just texting me thinking that this executive session is live. Can we, I, I'm sorry to do this, but I really think it's the right thing to do. I'm not sure if people weren't able to get on, if we could just quickly run down those. Well, how do we know if they're on there? Well, because I just got a text saying, well, so it might be you two if you're watching it live. Oh. So you mean to, you mean do a rundown of the general stuff that I just did? Please. Okay, so Hockham and Cemetery, we're working on resolution of that contract dispute. Um, I'm working with the DPW director. I'll be reaching out to the attorney for the contractor on that um, and trying to resolve that issue and wrap up that that work and that contract. Um, been doing the um, oversight, so to speak, of making sure that the town's ACO administrative consent order is complied with regarding the work at Algonquin and Wolpenoag, along with the town's engineers and DPW director. Um, we drafted the historic preservation restriction um, and the CPA grant funds grant for the funds at St. John's Church. That historic preservation restriction will be one which will be signed by Massachusetts Historical Commission and therefore will be perpetual. Um, which is what was voted on at town meeting and required under the CPA statute. Um, we facilitated the taking of Birch Meadow Road to make it a public way, which included all of the deed research, reviewing of the plans, and then helping to facilitate not the warrant articles, obviously, and then the taking process itself and recording those documents. Um, under our labor work, um, we've done the negotiations with the Municipal Employees Union, the police officer discipline ma disciplinary matter, a firefighter disciplinary matter, completed the supervisor's negotiations, uh, flex work hours policy and remote work policy. Um, separate from that, um, provided the cannabis equity policy to the board as well. 
Thanks again. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, they say, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? There it goes. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. All right. Great to see all of you. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do it, Jerry. Second. Hi, Alden. David. Hi. Uh,